Good afternoon and welcome to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management hearing on the Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget and the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report for the Department of Sanitation and the Business Integrity Commission. My name is Antonio Reynoso. I am the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Today we will hear testimony from the Department of Sanitation on its expense budget, capital plan, and general agency operations. After we hear from DSNY, we will hear from the Business Integrity Commission on its expense budget and general agency operations as well. The Department of Sanitation's proposal, uh, fiscal 2021 expense budget totals $1.76 billion and proposed capital commitment plan totals $2.1 billion. The committee looks forward to discussing such important topics as efforts to align city with achieving its goal of zero waste by 2030, a status update on key council sanitation priorities as well as commercial waste zones, and the various new needs included in the preliminary plan. The Business Integrity Commission's proposed fiscal year 2021 expense budget totals $9.7 million. The committee looks forward to hearing the department's testimony on important topics, including enforcement efforts targeting unlicensed waste haulers, um, agency performance in reviewing applications and commercial waste zones. We'll first hear from Commissioner Garcia of the Department of Sanitation and then proceed to hear from Commissioner Ganell of the Business Integrity Commission. The committee will then hear from members of the public. We thank you in advance for your patience. I would like to thank our committee staff for all of their help in preparing for today's hearings. Before we hear from the commissioner, we would like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues that are present in the Council Member Cabrera and Council Member Cohen, both from the Bronx. Um, just want to announce that this hearing may end early. Uh, if you have public testimony, please pay attention or stay. Um, if you leave and we shut the hearing down and you didn't get to speak, we want to just make sure you follow online, follow at home, or stay in the hearing at all times. Um, I guess we're going to swear. Uh, staff in? Yeah. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Right. Commissioner Garcia. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's portion of the mayor's fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget the fiscal year 2020 preliminary mayor's management report and our current programs and operations. With me this afternoon are Stephen Costas, first deputy commissioner for operations and Larry Cipollina, deputy commissioner for administration and financial management. As proposed, the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget allocates 1.76 billion in expense funds to the department of which 1.03 billion is for personal services and $0.73 billion is for other than personal services. Our fiscal year 2021 budgeted headcount is 10,045, including 7,808 full-time uniform and 2,237 full-time civilian positions. In addition, the department's proposed fiscal year 2021 capital budget is approximately 522.1 million. Of this amount, $326.3 million is allocated to facility construction and rehabilitation, $8.8 million is for information technology projects, and $187 million to replace equipment and vehicles. The funding resources under the proposed fiscal 21 budget will ensure that the department can continue to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Clean streets and public spaces contribute to a better quality of life that New Yorkers expect and appreciate. The proposed fiscal year 21 budget continues funding for components of the Mayor's Clean NYC initiative, including expanded Sunday and holiday litter basket collection service and targeted cleaning and enforcement efforts in high need areas. In the current fiscal year, districts across the city have benefited from supplemental litter basket collection service funded in partnership with the City Council at budget adoption last June. As a result of these investments, the department continues to maintain record high scorecard cleanliness ratings across the city. Through January 2020, the department has achieved a citywide average scorecard rating of 96.6% of streets rated acceptably clean, up from 95.2% in the year prior. 
Snow finding is also a core component of the department's mission, mission, ensuring safe travel for first responders, residents, and commuters. The fiscal year 2021 preliminary snow budget is 101.7 million. Our current modified snow budget for fiscal 20 is 111.1 million. The warmer temperature so far this year has produced a winter season that has yielded lower overall snow accumulations to date than the past few seasons with some forecasted snow events transitioning to rain or moving entirely away from the city. We have only activated for seven events to date this season compared to 18 events by this time last season. Our snow depth to date for the 2019-2020 winter season has been four inches. Of course, last year it did snow 10 inches in March. We know that preventing the accumulation of snow and ice on the roadways during snowstorms is critical to keeping New York City moving. Last spring, we announced a plan to purchase a new fleet of 10 large and 14 small brine trucks that spray a liquid salt solution which can prevent snow and ice from sticking in the first place and stay ahead of the impacts of frozen precipitation on critical roadways. The department received the first 20 of its brine pieces of equipment last fall. The department has already begun using brine pretreatment this winter season and we will continue to evaluate its performance. Last year, the department completed construction of the new marine transfer stations in accordance with the city's solid waste management plan adopted by the city council and approved by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation in 2006. Today, all the MTSs are fully operational and manage waste sustainably by shifting waste export out of the city from long haul trucks to marine and rail transfer facilities. The city's long term waste export program has cut greenhouse gas emissions associated with waste transport by more than 34,000 tons annually and has created a more equitable distribution of waste management infrastructure in New York City. DSNY is also in the process of implementing transfer station capacity reductions in the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and Southeast Queens pursuant to Local Law 152 of 2018, the city's waste equity law. When these cuts are fully implemented in September of 2020, we will have further reduced the concentration of waste management infrastructure and capacity in these historically overburdened neighborhoods. The commercial waste sector also plays an important role in achieving our zero waste goals. In November 2018, the department released a comprehensive plan for reforming the private carting industry by proposing the establishment of commercial waste zones, a safe and efficient collection system to provide high quality, low cost service to New York City businesses while advancing the city's zero waste and sustainability goals. The department developed this plan after years of extensive public outreach and engagement with a variety of stakeholders, including Chair Reynoso, this committee, and the council. One year later, in November 2019, enactment of landmark legislation was realized when Local Law 199 passed the City Council and was signed into law by Mayor de Blasio, authorizing the department to create a commercial waste zone system for New York City. The department is undertaking several steps to carry out the mandate of Local Law 199. Last month, the department published its final rule to create 20 designated commercial waste zones across New York City and authorize up to three private carters to operate per zone. There will be eight zones in Manhattan, two zones in the Bronx, five zones in Brooklyn, four zones in Queens, and one zone in Staten Island. This is the first of several rules that the department will promulgate in the first half of this year to implement the program that includes rules governing customer service for commercial establishments, operational requirements for private carding companies, health and safety protective measures for private carding employees, and recycling and organic requirements. By this summer, the department will begin the competitive procurement process to select up to three private carders to service businesses within each commercial waste zone. The department anticipates the transition period to the new zone system to begin in 2021 and last up to two years. The new commercial waste zone system is expected to reduce commercial waste truck traffic by more than 50%, eliminating millions of miles of truck travel, cutting air pollution, and reducing the time it takes workers to complete their routes. It is also expected to nearly double commercial diversion rates for recyclables and organic waste. The scope of this commercial waste reform is monumental, and the department wishes to thank the chair, the council, the Business Integrity Commission, our sister agencies, and all of the business, environmental, and labor advocates for their leadership in this transformational program to modernize the commercial carding industry. We look forward to your input as we implement the new system. 
To support the city zero waste goal, the proposed budget allocates a total of $14.6 million in fiscal 21 to the Department's Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability for waste prevention, recycling, and sustainability programs, including outreach and educational programs to resident schools, agencies, and NYCHA. New Yorkers are recycling more than ever, and the Department of Sanitation collected more recycling material last year than any year in over a decade. The city's overall diversion rate has reached 21.1, the highest rate in nearly two decades. But we know there is more work to do to increase the city's diversion rate and to make it easy for everyone to participate in recycling. The department continues to focus on diverting organics, food scraps, food soiled paper, and yard waste from landfills where they generate methane gas. Curbside organics collection serves 23 districts in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Buildings in the rest of the Bronx and Manhattan may enroll to receive collection. In addition, more than 1,200 schools, institutions, and agency locations now receive organics collection service. By the end of 2019, New Yorkers diverted 50,500 tons of organics, a 10% increase over the prior year. The department remains fully funded to continue curbside organics collection service in existing districts. We are actively working to grow the organics program in other ways. In fall 2019, we expanded the number of schools participating in organics collection by converting three existing school truck routes to organics collection. In addition, we have added 20 city agencies and institutions to existing organics collection routes as called for by Local Law 22 of 2019. We will also continue to recruit large apartment buildings to join the program, especially in areas where collection service already exists. We also continue to establish food service, food scrap drop-off sites to provide residents without curbside service the opportunity to compost their food scraps. By December 2019, we'd established more than 173 sites, up from 150 in January. We are also focused on giving businesses the tools they need to reduce food waste and save money. In March 2019, the department launched the Donate NYC online food donation portal to connect businesses interested in donating food to local organizations that feed hungry people. The tool created pursuant to Local Law 176 of 2017 is an innovative food rescue effort designed to improve connections between potential business donors and recipients, such as food rescue organizations and pantry shelters, community kitchens, and other emergency food programs. By far, about 350 organizations have registered, with half registered as donors and half recipients. Through the end of December, the portal successfully diverted more than 80,000 pounds of excessive food through the food donation portal. Our portfolio of textile and e-waste recovery programs continues to grow both in participation and in material recovered. In 2019, the department partnered to recover over 16,500 tons of textiles through Refashion NYC, clothing drop-off locations, and through Donate NYC partners. In 2019, the department recycled nearly 8,800 tons of electronics through the eCycle NYC, drop-off events, and the appointment-based e-waste collection program that we expanded citywide to Queens and the Bronx. The department also continues its popular safe disposal program, offering five permanent special waste drop-off sites and 10 borough-wide mm -hmm safe disposal events per year. In 2019, our SAFE program diverted over 630 tons of household hazardous material for safe and proper recycling. As of March 1st, plastic carryout bags are banned in New York State with limited ex exemptions. In addition, Local Law 100 of 2019, enacted pursuant to the state law by the City Council, requires that retailers collect a five cent fee on every paper bag used in New York City. 40% of these monies will be reimbursed to the city for the purchase and distribution of reusable bags to New Yorkers. The department has taken steps to educate the public regarding the new requirements that took effect this week. Since 2016, the department has distributed nearly a million reusable bags across the city, and we continue to work with elected officials, community groups, and others to distribute reusable bags. Since the beginning of this year, the department has held dozens of reusable bag giveaway events across the five boroughs. New Yorkers can receive a free reusable bag by taking the zero waste pledge or attending a reusable bag giveaway event. The department would like to thank this committee and the council for its leadership and support in the enactment of Local Law 100 that will incentivize individuals to use reusable bags and help us reach our zero waste goals. 
We also continue to closely monitor extended producer responsibility legislation for projects such as packaging, carpets, and mattresses. In closing, I wish to thank Chair Reynoso and the other members of this committee for continuing support of our programs and work. You are critical advocates as we work to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Thank you for this opportunity to testify this afternoon, and my staff and I are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And I just want to recognize you've been joined by Councilmember Chin. Uh, I want to start with waste exports. Uh, it seems like the preliminary plan has a $21.5 million added to fiscal year 2020 for waste export, uh, bringing the total budget to $412.8 million. And I just want to know what the additional funding covers and uh, why there weren't any additional monies necessary in the out years. And also, uh, after hearing your testimony, it seems like we've uh, increased our work related to organics, uh, to textile, to e-waste. Um, why is it that uh, we're seeing an increase in the recycling or the diversion that the city of New York is doing, but having to see an increase in the amount of money we're spending for exporting of waste? Um, so I think this is not unanticipated, the increased cost in the export budget as we brought the marine transfer stations online, the cost per ton did go up in those long-term contracts. We are still working with the Office of Management and Budget on what exactly we are going to need in the out years. And so this is really driven by uh, what the cost per ton is. The cost per ton, but have we seen a reduction, I guess, in, we in the amount of trash we're sending to? We were up slightly. The overall volume of trash and recyclables was up overall, and we were up slightly on the total trash number. We were up a lot on the recycling number. Okay, so I, I guess it comes to a larger question is zero waste by 2030 and whether or not we're moving towards that goal. I feel like um, there's a lot done here in your testimony again but none of it seems to be these bold, um, necessary um, adjustments that we need to make as uh, residents or that the city needs to take on to really help us get to zero waste. It just, I just really don't see it. Um, at, at this rate, we're gonna leave and not, not even be close to zero waste. No, we, we still do have a lot of work to do to get to zero waste. It is the toughest thing to get New Yorkers to change their habits. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I continuously make the uh, case that we're just dealing with the back end. We really need people to think about what they are purchasing on the front end. And we know that consumer behavior changes what's in our waste stream. We know that we used to have a ton of newspaper. We have almost no newspaper, but it sort of got supplanted by the fact that everyone started ordering things for delivery. And so now we have a lot more court cardboard than we ever did in the past. Um, so I remain committed to the goal of zero waste. I do think that we can get there, but it really will take a recommitment to make sure that we have the policies and programs in place to get uh, New York City over the hurdle. Okay, I just want to, anyone that, if there's a flash there, it's just very distracting. Um, yeah. What is that? What is it? Okay, so it's somebody outside. Um, just uh, as usual, I'm just concerned with uh, the what I feel is the lack of initiative we've taken to really try to get to zero waste. Um, the waste zones. Uh, I'm excited, of course, about commercial waste zones moving forward. I really think we're gonna make a dent on the zero waste goal. Uh, in the private sector more more effectively than we are in the public sector. Uh, but I saw in the preliminary plan that we've only seen an increase of four positions. Um, I wanted to talk about whether or not you think that's enough of a headcount increase and what you're projecting long term to, to staff and, and um, manage the commercial waste zone system here in the city of New York. Certainly. So, I mean, the four is really the first step there primarily for contract managers as we begin to write these RFPs and uh, write the contracts that will follow from them. Um, we are still working on what the final number is going to be to manage the entire program, but we're still at least 18 months away from okay. that actually being uh, necessary. So this is the down payment on making sure we can stand up the pieces of the program that are heavy on contract management and uh, moving those pieces forward. Um, so are we on schedule for full implementation by 2021? Yeah. So we are. Okay. 
Uh, I went through to talk about just garages in general. Um, we have some garages that are in disrepair or just been, uh, or we've had them for a long time or in need of some TLC. Uh, just what is your projection on capital cost uh, for uh, rehabilitation or just, uh, just the general care of uh, several of our garages? I have, um, where's that? I want to name two specifically. Uh, well, I'll find the two. I'm pretty sure you know who, which ones they are, but they're just the ones that don't look like the ones on the on the west side. No, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, while we do have the superstar on the west side, that is not the average look of a sanitation garage, and we've had some catastrophic failures of our facilities in recent months, um, particularly in the Bronx. Uh, and so, you know, it's a combination of several things. We have um, funding needs. Uh, we have got a lot of money in next year's budget. Uh, we're still evaluating. There's some things that have happened too recently to have good estimates for, but OMB has been uh, very supportive of um, making sure that we have the funding to uh, do the rehabilitation there. Um, but it's also a challenge of always finding space for us. Uh, and getting us through the process to make sure that uh, there's a long-term plan for sanitation facilities. So we are continuing to work with OMB to tighten up what our number is, but um, there is a substantial amount of money in next year's capital budget. And uh, are, we, are we done with the women's bathrooms? Am I done with what? With the women's bathrooms uh, facility? No, because the facility? Uh, we defaulted the contractor. Uh, they were not coming to work. So we, we have brought their bonding agent in to, so it's not a money issue. It's a question that the contractor was incapable of completing. So we've brought their bonding agent in and they will have to provide the finished product. Do we have a timeline as to when we can see that finished product? It should be, it should be relatively soon. Um, and it's only four, it's the, it's four of them were, were ones where we had to default the contractor. Right. Then what I have here is a garages 13 and 15 in Brooklyn specifically seem to be ones that you know could use some some well, attention. Well, technically 15 isn't a garage; it's a trailer park. It's a uh, say it again. I said it's not a garage; it's a trailer park. Ex okay, exactly. Right, uh, and 13 has serious structural issues. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, DCAS to locate space to build. We had wanted to build at the National Grid site that uh, became uh, too costly, but we think we may have located another site and we're working hard to make sure that we can, um, you know, get it through the normal city process, funding, ULERP, all that good stuff. So, the, but we can't build where the facilities are currently or just rehabilitate them? Oh, no, no, they don't, we don't fit there, like, there's no place to put a garage, no. So what about temporary, uh, temporary work that can be done to upgrade the facility so that they are at least something we can be proud of um, to put our sanitation workers on. Oh, no, there, it, Brooklyn 15 is not the only place where sanitation workers are in trailers. This is happening across the city for us. We are in trailers in the Bronx in at least two locations. That is our current short-term fix uh, is to do that. Uh, we have funding in the budget for rehabs of a lot of our uh, slabs. Um, but there is a tremendous amount of work to do. I'm glad that the money's there. That's a that's a, a, a an important issue. Um, the bike lane bike lane cleaning. We're having issues with uh, the mandatory width of bike lanes in the city of New York have to be wide enough so that you can fit a uh, street sweeper through it. Uh, or a plow. Or a what? Or a plow. Yeah, sure. Or emergency vehicles. A whole bunch of a whole bunch of things could fit in there. Uh, but bikers also, actually like to bike in the winter. Uh, the problem we have is that uh, vehicles come into the bike lane and make it dangerous for the cyclists. Um, so what we're hoping to do is have a conversation about smaller street sweepers that can clean uh, uh, either snow or street sweeping generally, um, and whether or not that can be done. And uh, it doesn't seem like there's any equipment within DOT or the Department of Sanitation that can do street sweeping uh, in a in a in a so smaller width for we, these bike lanes. We, we have we have uh, actually experimented with several different pieces of equipment. We don't have a problem uh, with doing it. We just need to be funded to buy them.
So, you know, we, we have pieces of equipment we like. We think they'd be effective at snow removal and at street cleaning, um, but we're not funded to buy them at this point. Yeah, we would love to. Do you have an estimate as to how much you think you would need to, to accommodate the future, the lanes we have now and the 250 extra lanes that are supposed to be created in short order by this administration? I mean, I, I'm working closely with DOT to figure out what years they're going to be coming into uh, into action, but we, we are open to using smaller pieces of equipment. But it means our fleet size has to get bigger so that we can do both. And, and I think we'll, we'll be open to that. I just think that we're, we need to talk about safety and allowing for vehicles to get into bike lanes really hurts our, our ability to keep um, cyclists safety, to keep everyone safe, to be perfectly honest. And for the excuse to be that we need to put a street sweeper through it, um, we just really want to solve for that, I guess. We're, we don't have a, this issue. is not a, an issue for us. This is a question of uh, we're happy to do anything you want as long as we have the equipment to do it. Okay, so I guess it would come down to like procurement and when your next round of street sweepers are coming in or whether or not we could modify that. Oh, you won't be able to modify it. You had to put out a new procurement in order to buy these. They're, they're very specialized. They're not anything like what we permanently buy. Okay. Um, right. So uh, you have to go through a procurement process. So, but I can't, I have to have both. So it's, yes. you, you get, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, it's not a one for my overall fleet has to get bigger in order for me to do different jobs in different areas. Understood. And we, we, we're, we want to have that conversation. So even outside of this, we, we really want to start thinking about it in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I have two more questions because I want to allow for my colleagues to ask some questions. And I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Brandon from Brooklyn. Um, the NYCHA recycling, it seems like uh, DSNY at one point was partnering with NYCHA nonprofit and civic organizations to do recycling work or recycling programs. Uh, from what I understood from those residents, it was very successful, uh, but it doesn't seem like there's any more funding provided by DSNY. Uh, why would we start a pilot to encourage NYCHA residents to recycle and then cut it off, um, especially what I see from motivated uh, tenant, uh, NYCHA tenants? So, I mean, I think that you're looking at just one small aspect of what has been the overall NYCHA program. We did an innovation grant uh, in Brownsville mm -hmm. um, for one person. We've determined that that isn't scalable, but we are also doing a lot of outreach with uh, through Grow NYC. In over 11 NYCHA developments, we retooled their programs and we're actually starting to see material. One of them is actually converting one of their containers to paper because we are getting that much material. So we think that using the GROW model is the most effective. Okay. I, I just want to, look, if we're encouraging folks, I think a big part of it is like changing culture um, and making sure that we, we um, educate and inform people and, and reward them for, um, for helping us recycle and so forth. Uh, and the scalability, I would love to have a conversation about that. But if it's working somewhere, why stop it from happening, I guess? Unless it's not working, it's it not successful. enough material. I'm not getting enough material. So it's, yes, working, but I'm, it's not like I'm getting huge amounts of volume. So, so you were tracking, I'm looking for tonnage. You were tracking the success of the program in, in outcomes? Uh, yeah, like how, many, how much material am I getting? I, I just want to say these type of things take time. Um, I, I'm aware of that, but we're doing better with the other program in terms of tonnage. So I want to speak about the other program, um, and is the organic drop-off sites um, and oh, just yes. organics in general. Um, it, DSNY also had contracts with local community organizations to do a lot of the work related to um, drop-offs, uh, and it seems like uh, those are being modified. I just want to know what is the what were they, let's say, two years ago or last year, and what are they now when it comes to the work that DSNY is doing with organic drop-off sites outside of outside of DSNY's work? So, so um, as I said in my testimony, we have a very large number of community organizations that we work it with for drop-off sites. I think you're specifically talking about those that are funded through the compost project. That budget has not changed in years. They have, in years past, had rollover money. They didn't spend their whole uh, volume in the one fiscal year rolled to another. Um, they just there isn't any rollover money this year, so, uh, but the budget, it did not change. So the budget and the work that DSNY is asking them to, to do is still the same? It's the same. Uh, the only expansion we did is that Grow NYC had been doing the um, compost on the go up in Upper Manhattan, which is wildly successful. Um, 
so there was money that we had to expend for that, and that's mainly just because we are getting so much participation. Are we concerned about the drop-off sites being reduced? I hear that there's They're a They're not being reduced. The Lower East Side Ecology Center? The Lower East Side Ecology Center, um, they may not necessarily, ch their drop-off site is primarily in Union Square. I mean, they do have drop-off, you can drop off in the park, but their biggest site is the Union Square site um, where they work. So I have not talked to Christine recently, but I didn't think she had any intention of not participating in that. Uh, there is a lot of pressure on the Lower East Side Ecology Center from uh, the Coastal Resilience Project. Uh, and so, you know, we continue to be very supportive of what she's done uh, over the last 20 years and what we hope she will continue to do uh, as we move forward. Uh, and there's also a, a Queens site. Um, I don't know exactly where. Big but, reuse Queens, under these, the Queens. It's a right. fabulous site. And, it's, um, and that's one that's contracted with the city as well or it's working with Big the Big reuse is one of our compost uh, project partners, yes. And they are they long term, do they have viability in that site? Uh, there's a challenge with that being parks property as well, so I don't have control of it. Um, but we are working with the parks department in terms of whether or not they should be there because I think that they do an enormous amount of work for the parks department uh, in terms of both taking a lot of material from the parks that are near there and giving them back compost in the spring. Uh, so I view them as a huge benefit uh, to the Parks Department, but those are ongoing conversations. Yeah, so I see those as two important sites, and both of them have questions, you know, they're, they're questions uh, in both sites on whether or not there's a long-term viability there, and I just want to, I would rather just resolve that. I, um, I would like to as well. I'm not the actual decision maker on it. So the Parks Department would be Parks the decision Department maker Parks Department is the one who controls it. But if, should that not happen? Shouldn't the Department of Sanitation? I guess uh, my problem here is organics is something we want to do. We want to talk about it citywide. We want to mandate it eventually. And it doesn't seem like we have, do we have a, a plan locally to allow for these places to continue to exist so they can help us with the tonnage that we're supposed to be receiving from them? Yeah, no, we are, we are actively working with the Lower East Side Ecology Center to see if we can find another location for them. That's okay. not on Parks. Property. And the Queen site, I think, is something else that, that I think we yeah, should Yeah, we have to work on that one as well. All right, so I would love to follow up on that. Um, and now, just because um, for, for time reasons, I want to make sure I give an opportunity to any of my colleagues. Should I have questions? Uh, I want to start off with uh, Councilmember Chin, and we have been joined by uh, Councilmember Constantinides. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Thank uh, you. First, I wanted to uh, really thank your department. Um, for the implementation of the bags gives away. Oh my goodness, I I've given away been, so many bags. Yeah, it's been quite successful. I mean, I had one giveaway where there were lines before we were able to set up, and within an hour we gave out a thousand bags, and people were mad at us that came late. <laughs> so we gotta um, continue to do that. And they're so colorful, people love it. And I see people carrying it around with them mm -hmm. to shop. So I have to that, do a lot of here, let me show you how it squeezes yes. into the little oh, and strawberry the, size. And the kids love it. So I, and I saw one sanitation department employee going out, I think it was during lunch hour, and he had one of those little bags. So it's like, good. Um, organic collection, mm -hmm. right? I represent Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. and I'm inundated with garbage, uh, especially in the financial district because it's, uh, it's become a growing residential population. And every day when it's garbage time, the garbage comes out very early, um, around six something, five o'clock, you see them putting out the garbage, lining all the sidewalk. When they do recycling, it's taller than me. Uh, it just so much. So the question is like on recycle, right? Is there a way that we can mandate that they really have to collapse um, the boxes? And because I see like bags of right. just cardboard box. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they didn't like tie them up, right? That's one thing. If there's a way that we can mandate that, do we need legislation um, no, to do that? Because there are, I mean, yesterday I was walking on John Street and this was a commercial area. So all these boxes on the sidewalk. 
it takes up a lot of space and they never bother to collapse it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that relating to organic, there's so much garbage. And I think a lot of it in there is food mm -hmm. uh, or like, um, you know, the, the food waste product. Mm -hmm. and, and that costs the rats, you know, especially in the summer. And we still couldn't work out uh, an agreement, you know, with the, the mayor's rat mitigation program to get people to put out trash later. There's some issues with union, and so that program still haven't gotten started. But I just see piles and piles of gar garbage, and especially in the financial district, the sidewalks are very narrow. So you have no place to walk with those garbage. And so I'm just looking at, is there a way to really work with um, the business improvement district down there and work with this building to get them to start doing the organic collection. And that will, you know, minimize some of the garbage. Otherwise, I mean, the other option is to do more pickup. Because every time they put out the garbage, it's a whole you know, block long. Um, that's not cost effective. And I really think that there's a way to start the organic program in those big buildings. Uh, the, the business improvement district down there, downtown Alliance, they actually are starting um, organic collection you know, on the street. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're implementing it very soon for people who sort of buy food and eat outside in the park to be able to do their part, right? And that might be a way to do some drop off. Mm -hmm. But like some of my neighbors are very environmentally conscious and they put it in the freezer and they bring it to the farmer's market at Bowling Green you know, once a week. That's great. But I think if we can work out a program where we can make it accessible, and some of these big buildings, they have space. They just need to somehow, we need to kind of push them to start doing that. Uh, because otherwise, like we're inundated with garbage. Uh, and I know the, the people who live in those buildings are upset about it, and there's whole FIDI, you know, neighborhood group. They want, you know, uh, to solve, you know, a solution. And I think with this is like we can also get them engaged. It's like, hey, we can work on this problem, but this is something your building and your neighbors can do, and the city can can help support it. So going forward, you think that could be you know possible for us to work on that? So um, absolutely. And then there are a couple. One, you do get three day a week collection of garbage, which is pretty you know more than a lot of other places. Uh, though you're very dense, you have very good recycling rates. Um, so we do think that, that food waste is a challenge. Um, I think that at this point in time, I'm very excited about what the Downtown Alliance is doing uh, in terms of their unmanned uh, drop-off program, which I'm hoping to see kick off. Uh, they had some customs issues uh, in the late spring. Um, we would have to look at the resources for additional collection of organics separately. Uh, and what that would cost, because I'm not currently funded to expand. It may make more sense to look at more drop-offs unless we are in a situation where it's mandated, because uh, I'm not sure I'll get enough material in those buildings to make it worthwhile to send a truck. But is there some kind of phase in? I mean, like, okay, we start off with drop-off chair. I mean, then we could work on a timeline that, mm -hmm. hey, you know, just like, letting people know about plastic, no more plastic bag, you gotta start bringing your own bag or pay for a, a paper bag mm -hmm. to give people enough time to say, start doing this, you know, you could drop off, but it's gonna come to your building, then you gotta take care of it mm -hmm. uh, in your building. And every building should do their part mm -hmm. because it just, it just unmanageable with so much a lot garbage. I mean, I have plenty of picture. No, no, I know, uh, I know what it looks you, like. Right? I know what so it looks that's, like. that's definitely something that we can work on and mm -hmm. maybe start with Downtown Alliance, see how the, the drop-off thing can help because we heard that in Battery Park City, they started similar things and, mm -hmm. it's, and it's working. Yeah. So that definitely we could do some pilot or maybe even have some building voluntarily start doing it, that. If, right. if there could I, be some kind of coordination. I, I yeah. will look at it, but I, I'm currently not funded to expand the organics program. Then you should let us know. I mean, this is the budget time. Yeah. Let no, that, us know that's... what, what you, how much you would need to get an organic program expanded.
I think I, I would like to know. I think the you know, chair would like to know that too, so that at least we could plan ahead if this is the mm -hmm. amount of money that you need to really expand that program. And the other thing, I guess, is the issue of getting people to to do it, to do that, but also the the thing with the, oh, the no, recycling with the cardboard because everybody's getting control. delivery, and we have yeah. we we have delivering site on the corner of the street. Yeah, no, it's so I, many boxes every single day. Yes, and like it, I hope that the city is making money back from these cardboard boxes. Not right now. The paper markets are pretty terrible. Um, but we, but they should be breaking down their cardboard, and we can look at that to make sure that it's clear in our rules what the requirement is, because that is fully within our control. Because if they if they don't do it, and if it's we, a lot of space, it's more yeah. space. And then one of the things that um, the downtown line suggested was that we might be able to mandate that they have some kind of machine. A baler. A baler. Um, if we need to do that, we'll we'll do that. Then yeah. Then this way we'll help them do their part. So, I mean, I'm happy to work with you in yes, that would be legislation great. Yeah. To, to sort of mandate that yep. if it's possible yeah, yeah, going no, forward. That'd, great. That'd be good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Constantinidis. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. Commissioner, good to see you. Good to see you. So, a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, last year we passed Local Law 97 which mandates uh, a reduction in, in emissions from city buildings. I'm pretty much assuming sanitation department uh, buildings are part of that. So what allocations were made during last year's budget or in this year's budget towards reducing uh, or retrofitting your buildings um, that are run or rented by sanitation uh, to comply with Local Law 97? Um, so we do a lot of work with the DCAS Office of Energy management with Anthony Fiore uh, in terms of doing upgrades around uh, lightings or rapid roll-up doors. And then in our, any of our new construction, and I don't know if you were here when I mentioned that most of my buildings, it's like I don't have some, uh, uh, that they meet all of the newest requirements uh, to meet the mandates of those uh, laws and energy efficiency. Great. So, I mean, so any new buildings that were built, let's say if there was a sanitation garage in Western Queens that was built. If it's built, yes. <laughs> it will be beautiful and it, it will be it, very efficient. And it, and it would be compliant with Local Law 97 mm -hmm. and all of the other mm -hmm. legislation that we've passed in the city yep. over the last few years. Yep. How are things? I think we're going through a siting process now. We are. We are in the middle of ULERP, uh, and so we have gone through the Land Use Committee at the Community Board as well as the full Community Board, and now it goes to the Borough President. Yes. So I'm excited. As am I. Um, I think we have to have a, a discussion, and, and you know my concerns. Mm-hmm. Right? We want to make sure that what, and I think that's less having to do with the Department of Sanitation. Um, I do believe that moving the garage is, a, is an environmental justice issue. Yeah. And we have to make sure we move it. Oh, it's in a terrible place. It's in a terrible I mean, it's been next to the Ravenswood houses for decades. And it's I'm not, not sure which came first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They may have moved in with us, not we moved in with them. But it's been there a long time. Yeah. Um, so it's time for it to move, and it's not in good condition, correct? Oh, it's in terrible condition. So, but what happens on, the, on that lot, we need to make sure that it's for public use. It's, if affordability and that we're not giving it away correct no, i am i well i i don't i will turn it over to dcas but i believe that uh i think that in this process particularly through the euler process that we should be making clear that we are taking what you and the community want into uh, sort of drafting those requirements and i mean it's a perfect place for affordable housing i agree uh, we need to make sure that it's really affordable now and not somewhat we, we delve into these AMIs that are not truly affordable. So is DCAS in the room? No. Okay. Well, I get my shot. <laughs> but someone should send them the message that it has to be truly affordable. Uh, for, for residents that are representative of that part of the community, mm -hmm. right? That it, ha it can't be, you know, at 125 AMI or something that just makes it unaffordable. It has to be to, to make sure we do this garage effectively it ha you know, and the replacement of this garage is going to have a huge impact on the community, positive or negative. And we have to make sure that it's a positive impact for the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lastly, I'll ask about electric, 
electric trucks. Ah, uh, you thought you were going to get away with it. No, <laughs> uh, we can talk about electric trucks. Uh, the mayor announced in January that all city vehicles were going to be electric by 2040. So that's 20 years from now, um, yeah, including garbage trucks. Mm -hmm. So I guess you can, can you give me an update on sort of what we're thinking around technology to make sure that uh, they're reliable, um, but that they're clean? Um, so we have been working with our vendor, uh, Mac Volvo, and they have been prototyping an electric garbage truck. Uh, it was briefly in the city. They need to do some more work on the battery power of it. Um, it has not, we, we look forward to putting it through its paces. It has not been put through its paces yet. We don't yet know what it's going to work, how it's going to work from a capacity point of view and any of that, but it is a full electric. Um, one of the things that I would say uh, in the interim is 24 is a long time from now. And between then and now, one, the technology on trucks has got to get better. Uh, and, I, and I do think that it will. But um, the other challenge is we have electrical constraints at every single one of our facilities. I couldn't put another charger in anywhere. I just do not have the power. Um, but there are things that we can do now, like there's start-stop technology for garbage trucks that will basically cut their emissions by a third. Um, we got some of them funded in this budget round capitally, but obviously that's something that we know works, is here today. That what, we could can you walk, what is, run through that technology really quickly? It's called stop-start technology stop by okay. uh, Afenko. Um, and really what it is is it sort of turns off when you get to a light or if you're at a stop. Okay. Uh, and so it, it, what we have seen with the ones that we have is that we're using a third less fuel. Okay. So, um, so I feel like we want to make sure that we are doing the R&D for full electric. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very quiet. We've seen them demoed. We may have to make them make noise. Uh, we, we want people to see us coming. Uh, but, but there are other things I feel like if that we're not waiting till 20 years out. There are things I think we could do now uh, to really push the, the limit uh, uh, with the technology we have. And as far as the, uh, the commercial waste zones and thinking about environmental concerns and relating to trucks, how are we thinking uh, that's going to be in the RFP? And, and so there, there are some minimums that they will have to meet in terms of how cleanly they are. Uh, and then they will get extra points for going above and beyond and being cleaner and making investments both in their fleet and uh, if they're going to clean facilities like final use, uh, if they're going to move the material out by rail or barge rather than by truck, that scores more points. Okay. All right. uh, Mr. Chair, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions uh, by both council members. Um, <clears throat> containerized trash, containerized trash on curbside containerized trash. Um, most large cities or some large cities do this work. It helps with rat reduction. Um, it also allows for the trash to be in a in a stored location outside of the middle of the streets. Um, there's practically a war a war on sidewalks or pedestrians. Uh, we use our sidewalks for everything. Um, and at some point, we have to think outside the box as to how the future of our walkable, livable city is going to be. And we don't want to be trash New York, right? We want to make sure that we can handle that more appropriately. Do you think containerized curbside, uh, tra uh, c uh, containerizing trash curbside makes sense? And uh, especially in the private industry, so when we're talking about um, trash in, in uh, commercial bids, uh, or do they make more sense in smaller areas where maybe our residential garbage trucks don't need to stop every five seconds, instead they can stop on corners of the streets and so forth. Just the idea of containerized trash, uh, uh, curbside containerized trash, whether or not that's something that you've thought of and it's something you would be willing to explore. Yeah, no, no, we're definitely thinking about it. I think that, um, uh, it's not inexpensive in terms of the infrastructure around it. Uh, the other challenge is that sort of the two um, models that are used elsewhere are either sit in the parking lane or sit under the street. Under the street is going to be really challenging uh, just because of how much else is already there. 
Um, and then, you know, we're going to have to think very carefully through, you know, where is it being located? Um, you know, I'm not sure that everyone's going to want there to be the house where the whole block comes to put their garbage. Uh, I could be wrong, and I want to be open-minded about it, but I think that that may be a hurdle in terms of moving forward. The other challenge is, as uh, Council Member Chin, it's a lot of material. Like, you know, if you think about putting the material she's talking about from basically one building in a container, it's there is no more parking. Like, the, the, it's still a whole block long. Um, is that just, uh, there, there are some things we're also thinking about on the residential side for future buildings, uh, but we're definitely open to it. We think that there are some challenges, but we're definitely open to looking at uh, how this could work, both in, uh, in bids as well as in uh, the residential side. I definitely think it's something worth exploring in smaller residential uh, blocks, one or two family homes, where you know we won't take up too many parking spots, but um, also uh, see if it makes sense underground. Uh, if we want to solve, I, I think if you're, we want to, you're always going to have trouble underground. You have to remember that even in a single family world, you have a, a water connection and a sewer connection coming out of every single building, every about 20 feet. So uh, it's, not, it's not a lot. It's not a huge amount of room. So I'm like solution oriented, so I don't see problems. I, I, I see the problems, I want to get to solving them, but if we don't explore it, you know, we'll never no, know. No, I'm, I'm totally open to, to exploring it. Um, I, I think, it would, and also when it comes to actual rat mitigation, we've done a lot of things in the city, whether it's dry ice, poison, rat soup, all of it to try to find solutions to, to reducing rats. And the one tried and true, tried method that makes sense is containerizing waste. That is the way to solve it. And if we want to be serious about it, then we should talk about containerized waste in a more, in more openly and publicly. But no, if it doesn't happen in just a policy, in, in a just a general conversation, I'm, I'm looking forward to putting legislation forward so that we can have a more substantial conversation. We will have a, we, let's talk more. Okay, the legislation is coming anyway, so we're gonna have to oh, talk. Okay. Um, yes. no, but just by a, the way, a on a very funny story, in prepping for this, I was at an event in Williamsburg. I was going over the Williamsburg Bridge, and all of a sudden, rats started jumping out of a container. Not mine. Uh, apparently, they did not want to go to Manhattan. They were trying to get back to Brooklyn. So, but it was, it was not <laughs> There's my more food in moment. Manhattan. If they were smart, they would stay there. If they were stayed in Manhattan, they would have. Yes. I was just like, what are they doing? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> We have, we have three things here, um, uh, litter basket service, lot cleaning, and highway ramp cleaning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when a long time ago, we used to do this thing called the budget dance with uh, Mayor Bloomberg. He would take things out so he could put it back in later. It was all theater. At this point, we're talking about $8.6 million in one. Uh, I don't know how much the highway ramp cleaning is ex uh, exactly. $864. Eight hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars, not even a million dollars, and yeah. the lot cleaning. Yeah. And it's just uh, it's six uh, six workers, I think, or thirty-one sanitation workers and six supervisors. I just don't want to do the dance, and I feel like these are low-hanging fruit. They're um, very popular in the city council. Why even have this conversation uh, when it comes to the overall budget of uh, two point seven million, I believe. Um, 1.7. 1.76 billion. Uh, why are we even having this conversation on items that, again, are popular and seem to be affecting change? From what I understand, the little basket service is actually improving the cleaning, um, the, the cleanliness of the sidewalks. Um, lot cleaning is, is good for quality of life and so forth. And then the highway ramp cleaning, um, I think someone already does that work and we subset, we, we complement. the ramps. Yeah. The ramps. We so just I, just the ramps. I just don't want to have to go to B&T and that you give us this in three months and think it's a, you're, you know, we're winning. Uh, this is just things that should be baseline. It should just be something we can handle. So um, some of them used to be baseline, uh, not ever the, the litter basket collection. Um, but it was only funded last year. Uh, they did not continue the funding into 2021. Um, 
I would love to see it, but I am not at the table with you when you are talking about the other bigger budget issues that are going on right at the moment. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, th these would be painful if we don't see them restored, but I know that there are a lot of pressures this particular cycle on the budget. So, that I'm, I know from the news, but I'm not in the room when you're negotiating. There's always pressures. Um, the mayor always tells us that, you know, the recession is coming. He's been doing it for six years and it just never got here. But uh, I think that it's very important that you, I just want the administration to take note that these are not necessarily wins. There are things that we assume should have been in the budget that he should have baselined, um, that we don't want to negotiate about anymore and that we don't want to do this budget dance. It's just cumulatively, when it comes to the bigger picture, um, they, 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 uh, means so much to the city of New York and means so little to our overall budget. So yes. I just want to make sure that we have that conversation I, more um, openly. Okay. Um, no, I, I agree. Um. Okay. So, so I, I think we're on the same page there. Um, street sidewalk cleanliness. So unfortunately, I looked at a can I take this map? I have a map here. I don't like that map because it's I don't like, like it everything's either, over 90% except it's red. Yes, but nine, so that's, that's a, a part of the problem, I think. Uh, I think a couple of things. Uh, you would want something that's rated from like 1 to 10. I think no street in the city is rated under like 84 or something like that. Oh, no, we have bad months. There, there can be bad but months. They, but under New York City education levels, they're considered passing. And that's my problem with these percentages and these systems. It doesn't seem like the grading system truly accounts for the cleanliness or, or of the street. If I tell my, my community we're at an 85% cleanliness level, they would think that is a, that's a B minus, that's a B. We could do better, but we're doing really well when actually it would be one of the dirtiest streets in the city of New York. So I just think that we need to re, uh, have another conversation. And I know this is not the Department of Sanitation that runs this, but have a conversation about what street cleanliness looks like. But the problem I have here is looking at this is that the areas that are dirtiest are also the zip codes or the EDs that or census tracts that are considered the poorest parts of the city of New York. Um, Northern Manhattan, Southern Bronx, uh, Central and Northern Brooklyn. Um, those, and it's a concern to me that, uh, or I would like actually to ask, when you get this as a Department of Sanitation uh, from you know, the Office of Sustainability in the, in, Operations, operations, mayor's operations. Office operations. When you get this, what is wh what do you do with this information? Does it does it do you move resources around? How do you engage with it? I mean, there there are several different ways. I mean, there, there's part of this is when you think about cleanliness, it's not necessarily moving resources around. We do have more resources in some of those locations that you've uh, noted, um, particularly in North Brooklyn. Uh, but you, because it gets rated well, does not mean it wasn't dirty in the morning. Like I am cleaning up after people across the city all the time. Um, and so, you know, it is a constant battle to keep up with the amount of sort of drop-offs, litter, illegal dumping that is occurring. Um, and so we have put extra resources into certain areas of the city, including in North Brooklyn. Um, and we continue to be very focused on those, and they get also will get extra uh, job training personnel located within them, or even uh, community service work located within them. But it is it's a, it's just a lot. It's a lot of work. So you do use this to to yeah to like where do we have where do we have and we try and be ahead of it. I mean, like our supervisors are out there all the. I mean, we never know where they're going to go. Um, so they are out there looking for things that are dirty to make sure we're catching them sort of before uh, we get graded. I would, I'm going to be proposing, so another thing is that it's very objective. I've gone out with these graders uh, that tell us what the cleanliness is, and they don't tell you exactly what they're looking at, but they each have a different uh, system by which they grade these. It's very, what I believe, subjective. Subjective, yes. You, that's, you're using um, the right word. And I, wanna, I want to start having like a checklist that allows for us to know that uh, how the person in the Upper West Side grades um, is similar to how the person in Williamsburg grades. So I, I don't, obviously I don't, I don't run that program, but my understanding was that they had a training manual uh, that was supposed to make it so that it was even across 
all of the different districts. Um, so I don't, I don't know that for sure, but that was my understanding is if it has, you know, three things on it, it gets this number. If it gets, it has, you know, 10 things, it gets this number. Um, I thought it was pretty prescriptive, but I, I have not ever seen their training of their people, so I don't know that. So I just wanted to make sure that whatever resources we're allocating to street cleanliness, that this actually have some value and that you use it, and it seems like you do. So We, we do. I mean, and, and some of our cleanest districts have almost no street cleaning resources. You know, they have no alternate side. They have no broom service. So, um, so when it comes to uh, our export work that we're doing in the city of New York, um, there's some residential waste still going to private sanitation garages. I wanted to ask about that. Private transfer. I mean, sanitation yes. waste transfer stations. I'm waste sorry. transfer stations. Yes, there, there, are, there are occasions in terms of like just for operational necessity, in terms of being close to the district or that they're going to dump both sides of their vehicle, i.e., their split body, half organics, half refuse, um, that they are dumping because they have to go no matter what there. Um, and then there have been times where we've had work that we needed to do at some of the marine transfer stations and they closed for a period of time. Uh, and so we would send waste, we would divert waste to other places. So I assume that the swamp plan was our goal to relieve ourselves from having to dump in private. Uh, um, in so private. There, the swamp actually anticipates that there is some flexibility if you have operational needs. Okay, I would just want to do. Do we know how much those contracts are in these private? Um, the contracts trusts? are all big. So they're all backup contracts. Um, but we can get you the volume, the dollar figure, like spent last year. Is there one area that's that specifically uh, relying heavily on these backup uh, waste transfer stations? So we it um, has been primarily in Eastern Queens and some in going up to Yonkers. Uh, I would just like to, to see those kind of understand that a little better uh, because I thought these uh, marine transfer stations were supposed to handle most of this or, or I mean they handle the vast majority I mean we're like you know we have challenges post holiday where we're we're basically doubling the volume going through them where it it becomes too much for them to handle uh, and also sometimes it's it just makes sense on a we are not usually open on a Sunday and other agencies actually have their own waste they need to get rid of so there are some contracts we still hold for that as well but we can provide you with that i appreciate that and then um, i think my last uh question is going to be related to uh, uh mechanic to truck ratio um the information that i had had us at uh, approximately 22 percent out of service rate um, which is concerning we were the highest out of service rate was in DSNY, which makes sense that DSNY and FDNY, who have the larger, more complicated vehicles, would need the most amount of work or the most expert or expert type of work. Um, I have huge issues with what I am assuming is understaffing um, and a lack of mechanics to handle this work, especially um, high-level mechanics, right? I want to make sure that we, we're able to differentiate between uh, general auto mechanics, uh, part-time ones, automotive electricians, and so forth, just the, the array of different types of mechanics that we have, ones specifically that handle uh, garbage trucks or that are able to work on garbage trucks. Um, we, it, it seems to me that we had a one to 10. For every 10 vehicles, we have one mechanic, and that's a, a concerning ratio to me. We'd just like to hear your understanding of how this is supposed to be working and why a 22% uh, out of service rate is, is, is perfectly fine. Um, so I don't think a 22% out of service rate is perfectly fine. Today we are at a little bit over 16%, uh, in part because we uh, did not have our vacancies filled. Um, and that was incredibly problematic. We have also been um, challenged by the fact that so many of our facilities are um, in such bad, like particularly our central repair shop, 50% of it is not usable for heavy duty trucks right now. It's, this is a building that is the size of the Empire State Building. Uh, and we literally don't have 50% of it right at the moment. Um, so we have made great improvements because we did get the head count and we have been able to bring on uh, auto mechanics. Uh, auto electricians, we are trying. They are really hard um, to recruit right this second. We know we need them, but they're really hard to find. Um, but you feel like we have the, within our head count, that we have the capacity to, to 
uh, have a, 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 I guess, a more responsible out of service rate? Right. So it, within once we got up to headcount, uh, the out of service rate went down significantly. And when did you start the, the headcount increase, I guess, is what I it's would not, ask? The headcount, we September, October. I think we started the hiring process in uh, the beginning of the fall. It takes a long time to get people hired just process-wise. Uh, but once we got the approvals uh, and we began to make those hires, we've seen those out-of-service rates come down significantly. And do you know how many folks were hired uh, to fill uh, the uh, headcount? I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. I think at one point we were probably down 35 mechanics. So being down 35 mechanics, that, that would explain um, yeah, a lot. We were we did not have enough people. We were we were dying on the vine. Do you feel that once you fill that headcount, that you're more than you'll be more than happy with the out of service rate that I you have? I feel like we've made great progress on that uh, since. I mean, the only thing that I say would, that could be a problem for us is we still are having facility issues uh, in terms of having the bays for people to actually do the work. But um, do we have a we have a plan for that? I guess the oh capital yeah, we have in lots the, of the capital plans. Project? It's going to take a long time. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, so can we talk about that? So do we have like a capital plan for how we're going to increase bays? Oh, yeah. So no, they're, these... they're included in every garage project. They're included in what we're rehabbing at the central repair shop. Um, but that we've, we've had 50 percent of that shop down for months now. Uh, so we're hoping to get it back up. So, but then we're going to have to do the other half uh, because of the structural failures. So do you. I'm going to be requesting in this bu in this executive budget uh, for an increase in mechanics, um, and I just I wanted, wouldn't be sad about that. Excuse me. I you, would not be sad about. I, that. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that uh, so the ha not the half life the life of these vehicles is supposed to be a certain amount of years. I think because we have great mechanics, we've extended them from seven to eight, I believe, years. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great that's a great thing. To, to note that they're doing a good job in extending the life of these vehicles, but um, if we have too many of them off the road, then you know it, we're losing money as a city. We're being irresponsible for it. Um, let's let's try to close this gap and and have a more responsible out of service rate. I also understand that there's been some consolidation that has been done. I hear about parks department vehicles and other department vehicles moving through what traditionally would have been like a sanitation garage. I just want to have a better understanding of it, which I think I do, but I want a better understanding of it from you, mm -hmm. but also um, I think that we need to hire a lot more mechanics and I'm going to be making that request um, okay. at the city council. Okay. Um, and we've been rejoined by council member Cohen and I believe he has some questions. I'm going to try. Go <laughs> ahead. You, Go ahead, council member Cohen. Thank you very much. I think just I want to preface. I think this is my first budget hearing on the committee because I really realize as I'm looking at, at the, the facts and figures, I know nothing about the Department of Sanitation. Uh, and in fact, I came from public safety. And when you think uh, your budget is significantly smaller than, than the police department. A little bigger than I am. Yes, but you know, I mean, as a New Yorker, I think everybody has contact with the Department of Sanitation. Uh, you know, if you're, hopefully you don't have contact with the NYTB, you know, as a much smaller percentage, you touch everybody, everybody. Uh, and I think that you do a lot with the money you have. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the uh, the PS money. It, it's you know a, a billion of the uh, of the. I want to make sure I'm saying this right. Um, of the total budget. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell the breakdown between uniform and civilian in terms of dollars? Uh, I don't know if I have the uniform. There, there are almost 8,000 uniform employees and a little bit over 10,000 total employees. Uh, so the vast majority of the personal service budget is for uniform employees. But, we, but we I, I can get you the exact split, but um, I would say that it's like... That's the number like, of jobs. Uh -huh. it's like 700 out of the billion. Probably 700 out of the billion is uniform. Uh, can you just like, I, I know that there's, the answer is long, but in terms of the civilian, what are the kinds of jobs the civilians... Certainly. So... Um, we have probably the largest uh, piece is in uh, our support services. And so that is gonna be auto, things like auto mechanics, um, as well as uh, carpenters and plumbers and electricians who take care of our buildings. So those end up being about a little bit over a thousand people uh, across that. And then we probably have about, uh, we have a lot of IT people who are in that. Uh, and then we have 
enforcement agents who are in that particular group as well, and then obviously clerical support. Some enforcement is civilian and some is not? Or oh, yeah, enforcement agents are civilian. If you are sanitation police, uh, then you are uniform. The sanitation police officers carry guns. The enforcement agents do not. Really? How many sanitation police are there? Uh, I'll get you the, the exact number. It's, it's like below 100. What do, what do they do? Uh, so they primarily do things like illegal dumping um, and theft of materials. Uh, so they'll do stakeouts. Uh, we also have ones that are specifically doing inspections of transfer stations uh, and looking at those as well as um, dealing with sort of syringe and needles and stuff like that as specially trained officers. Enforcement agents primarily just write tickets. And in terms of facilities, I heard the chair asking you a lot of questions about garages. Again, I, that I, there's a lot I don't know about this. Where is the Department of Sanitation headquartered? 125 Worth Street. And then like the facilities, the, that facility, uh, when I leave here and I go up the west side, there's that big, there, I think there's two big buildings, right? There are two. There's the beautiful one at Spring Street and the other less beautiful but still very, very nice at 57th Street. What happens at those buildings? Those are, those are great. What goes on? What, oh, what, those are garages. They're, they're just garages? They're just garages. So uh, at, at, uh, at uh, Spring Street, it's Manhattan 1, 2, and 5 are in that building. Uh, and then at 57th Street, it's four uh, and seven and the broom garage. And, and I, I, I heard, I didn't, maybe this got fleshed out after I left, but there's a, an issue with garage space in the Bronx? Uh, yes, there is significant issue with the garages in the Bronx. Can I get a thumbnail on that? Here, here, here let's, let, we'll do that. Uh, 3A collapsed. Uh, and Where's 3A? 3 Farms. is West Farms Road. Um, uh, enforcement, we had to evacuate because it was going to structurally fail. 9, 10, and 11, you can't walk or drive on the floor because it's structurally not safe. Um, 7 and 8, the ceiling, they're on top of each other. The ceiling fell down, so we're sounding that every week. Um, I, I, I'm getting the Bronx, the facade at Bronx 6, the slab at Bronx 12. Uh, yeah, no, I'm having some problems. Are, are with the, the numbers, Bronx. I'm going to embarrass myself, are they? Are they are they corresponding to community boards? Yes, yes. Okay. All of my I should garages know you would think are, after. are coterminous with community boards. You know, I, I do always say, I think I told you this, that the reason I think I'm not as knowledgeable about san the, the way the sanitation department works at the district is I get very few complaints. People's trash gets picked up, and then they don't, you know, there's, I get a lot of complaints about a lot of agencies, but by and large, you know, you get the trash picked up and people don't complain, so I find yeah. that I... No, no, we, we actually try yeah. and make people happy. It is, it is one of the things that I say makes it a very nice agency to work for, is people really do want their communities to be happy with the service that they're receiving. Where, where is 7 and 8? It's in Manhattan at 215th Street. And, and that facility also, I didn't hear exactly what was the... So it's uh, one, one garage on top of the other. The ceiling from is falling down into the other garage. The cement is falling down, so we have to... We'll have to stabilize that. We just don't, we don't at this time know, well, one, I had to find swing space, but also um, we don't yet have a cost estimate on it. So we're working through the dollar figures with OMB. And I mean, they've been open to putting money and it's just we have, a lot of, we have a lot of things going on that are not in great shape. Do you own most of your space? No, we have a lot of lease space. Uh, so it, it really varies across the city, but we do have a lot of lease facilities. Who does your capital work? Um, it's split between DDC and the department. So we're working on building Bronx 3 right now. They will do Staten Island 1-3. We're doing the Bronx 9, 10, and 11 garage. Um, they did two of the marine transfer stations. We did two of the marine transfer stations. So I don't know if you're allowed to say it. Like, is there any, would you say that there's been a qualitative difference in, in, in the work that each agency does in terms of capital? I think I'm going to okay. defer on that. <laughs> uh, I don't. I would like to, uh, uh, you know, as part of the committee, at some point, I'd like to see some of the facilities, and I, I'm going to reach out to. Yeah. I, I'm sure, you know, the chair has been probably, you know, because been doing this a long time, 
uh, has done all that. But since I'm relatively new on the committee, I'd like to see some of the facilities. We would love to have you out. I appreciate that. Thank we'll you, Chair. I'll show you the, the good, the bad, and the, and the ugly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Heim Deutsch. Councilmember, do you have any questions? Yeah, am I getting my corner waste baskets picked up again this year? Seven days a week? Uh, that's not currently funded, no. What? That is not currently funded in fiscal 21. Councilmember, did you say hi to the commissioner? I was here before and I checked. <laughs> it's Good lovely afternoon. to see you. Okay, we got to find We were we were talking about the basket weight pickups too. So the basket the waste basket pickups for sure is something that we want to continue. We would love to get it baseline. Yeah. So we'll be talking in BNT to see if we could just make that permanent. Um, instead of it being something we have to negotiate every single year, we'd rather just that be the standard across the if board. If you are making it permanent, make it so that it is permanent with headcount, not just overtime. It yes. would be cheaper. Okay. I will, I will note that. I think uh, we're, we're all three of us are on BNT. So it's noted that we were like, if we baseline it, we want to make sure that it's a content for and headcount as well. Um, outside of that, uh, we have a lot of follow-up to do. Um, uh, I just want to make sure I recap on three things that I really want to make sure that we pay attention to and don't let, uh, don't let go. Uh, the sites for um, organics collection and the compost project. I want to make sure, I want to see if the budget has stayed the same. I want to make sure we show the same amount of support for the folks that have been doing this work for a while and also see if maybe working together we can talk to the Parks Department about the Queen site um, and just want to have a better like timeline and understanding of how we're going to ensure that the Lower East Side Ecology Center is okay. Um, it's just, it could just be my ignorance, um, but I'm, I just want to make sure I get clarity. Yep. That's one issue that's extremely important to me. Um, the other one is the mechanic to truck ratio, just want to really get the, the um, out of service rate as low as possible. Um, and if it means that we just need to get, we need to get some folks in, let's talk about getting them in. Um, the nitro recycling, want to have more conversations about um, how it might have felt that that was unsuccessful, uh, but it seems like there was some motivation in Brownsville. I also do want to say culture takes time, um, and we might have not seen some returns in the first two, three years, but as time goes on, people start getting used to things. So want to just have another conversation with that. If not, I think I'm going to take it to the speaker and talk about it as a council initiative, and maybe it's something we would want to do where NYCHA developments, the tenants there get to take control or um, get to be a partner with the Department of Sanitation in recycling and, and sorting. Uh, and I think, yeah, the litter basket, I think we're going to take care of in, in, um, in BNT and the bike lane stuff. Uh, I feel like that's a, a larger conversation to be had, uh, for the smaller, for the smaller, uh, street sweepers. I want to have that conversation because it has to go through procurement and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, these, these, if we, if we buy all these new, new equipment, we're talking about seven, eight years that they might last or however long a street sleeper lasts. I really want to have a track or a timeline as to when we can start seeing that type of work. Because when we talk about the city of the future, the, the, the streets master plan and so forth, um, those things matter. So I want to make sure we follow up with that as well. Um, I think we're going to meet one more time before it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. I hope to have better understanding of how we are doing with these, those things that I just talked about. Um, and I appreciate, I do appreciate your time. Thank you for being here, uh, Commissioner. And oh, before we, we're gone, I want to give uh, Councilmember Deutsch more time. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. It's great to see you here. Um, so my question is, uh, what is the budget on snow removal? And what happens when you don't use uh, that budget that's well, what's budgeted for snow removal and what happens uh, to that surplus and why can't you use that for some other resources that we are asking for here in the council that we don't have to go back to BNT? Certainly, um, our current snow budget is 111 million. Next year's snow budget is 101 million. Uh, the snow budget is in the charter and is a rolling five year average. Uh, that is how it is set every year. Um, when we do not use our budgeted number, it just goes back to the general fund uh, and can be used for us as well as anyone else. So why can that be used, like um, for the corner wastebaskets? I think last year we put in about 8.6 million. 
And so you have here 111 million that was budgeted in 2019. I don't think I remember it's maybe one snow day or two, maybe. It's actually some more events so, that we actually did have to get ready so for. That's a, that's a lot of money. So why do we have to come back with 8.6 million to, so, um, to ask so, uh, in the budget uh, to get our streets clean? So while it would appear, and, and just let me just remind folks that it, it is possible it could snow in March or April as it has in the last two years. So I don't want to count my eggs before they're hatched. There's still 111 in, million. Well, no, there, there's not a hundred. We've spent some of the money. We do always spend some of the money ahead of snow season. We did buy salt this year. We did buy a lot of salt. Um, uh, but you also have to recall in the way that they budget it, um, it doesn't just roll over into next year's fiscal budget. I don't just get to keep that money from fiscal nine, from fiscal uh, twenty, and just use it in twenty one. So, right. It, so it's it. So what does that what does that money go? It goes if there are other deficits within the financial plan. It goes to the the money goes to this year. Are there any other deficits in the financial plan that we know of? There are definitely places where there is funding needs uh, in so this can we, year. Can we just can we look into that before we um, go back and try to fight for the 8.6 million that we could use to something even else? Just, I could never make the decision to take the snow money and use it for litter baskets without OMB approval. So we should we should uh, collaboratively. So OMB. with the permission of the chair, we should write a letter to OMB and making this request to OMB, in other words. Right. They, whenever there are surpluses in any agency budget, they will take those surpluses and then they, it go, you go through almost like how we do a new needs process in terms of the, the reprioritization of what needs to be funded. Uh, okay. Thank yeah, you. And can I just, I, for some clarity here, usually we get, we get clarity on exactly how much we spent on snow on the snow work the following fiscal year, and we closed gaps, right? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes I need to take money from other parts of my budget when we have a bad year and uh, and fund the overage. Uh, it just depends year to year. That's why it's a rolling five-year average. Okay, all right. So we'll have more discussions about that. Um, if we could use that money somewhere else, and we could be smart about it, I guess we'll try. But um, it's OMB. They try to take money away from OMB. It's trying to get money from OMB is tough, uh, but we'll work together. Um, I really appreciate your time again, Commissioner, and thank you so much for being here. Um, as usual, uh, this part of the meeting is a, is not adjourned. This is over. Uh, over. Have a good day. We're going to be hearing from Bic now. Uh, can we get like just a one minute one minute break, Commissioner? You know, one minute.
Okay, we're gonna reconvene our hearing. We've now been joined by Commissioner Grinnell. Um, I wanna allow for you to be sworn in, Commissioner. Do you affirm to tell truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you have some testimony? Yes, I so do. So please uh, go ahead with the testimony. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Reynoso, Council Member Chin. I am Noah Janelle, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission, or BIC. Joining me today are BIC's Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs and General Counsel, David Feldman, and Deputy Commissioner of Regulatory Compliance and Background Investigations, Allison Bonfoy. Seated behind us are BIC's Deputy Commissioner of Investigations, Cheryl Garcia, and Assistant Commissioner of Finance and Administration, Cindy Haskins. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. I will begin with some background information about BIC. We are both a law enforcement and regulatory agency with a total budget for fiscal year 2021 of $9.71 million. BIC currently has a total of 85 employees of a total authorized fill of 91. Our roster includes 11 investigators, 10 attorneys, 11 intelligence analysts, and seven auditors, not including supervisors. In addition, we work with a squad of detectives from the NYPD's Criminal Enterprise Investigations Section who are physically stationed in BIC's offices. BIC's investigators and attorneys frequently work with those NYPD detectives on long-term criminal investigations, but the detectives generally do not participate on the regulatory side of our enforcement operations. BIC was created through Local Law 42 of 1996 to regulate the commercial garbage hauling or trade waste industry and rid it of the grip of organized crime and other corruption that had plagued the industry for years. <clears throat> Soon after the agency's creation, when it was named the Trade Waste Commission, the City Council expanded the agency's jurisdiction to include oversight of the city's public wholesale markets the produce and meat markets and the new Fulton Fish Market in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx, along with the meat markets in the Meatpacking District in Manhattan and Sunset Park, Brooklyn. We play a unique role in city government as we work to regulate and improve these industries. In fact, there is no other agency quite like BIC anywhere in the country. One of BIC's chief functions is our comprehensive background investigations process. In the past year, we have successfully removed a number of companies and ind in individuals from both the trade waste industry and the public wholesale markets whose participation in those industries ran contrary to BIC's anti-corruption mission. Since our last budget testimony in March 2019, BIC has denied 12 applications across the trade waste hauling industry and the public wholesale markets. For example, in June 2019, the Commission denied the respective license and registration renewal applications for Flag Container Services, Inc. and for MICA Construction, Inc., two related companies. There were numerous factors that supported the denials, including the fact that one of the principals was under indictment for criminal acts relating to a murder and drug sales, as well as a history of unsafe practices at construction sites. The flag denial is currently on appeal. In October 2019, the Commission denied a photo identification application for an individual in the new Fulton Fish Market. As the result of a BIC-led investigation, that individual was convicted in the Southern District of New York of stealing nearly a million dollars from his employer in the new Fulton Fish Market. He was sentenced in August 2019 to 30 months imprisonment and to pay more than $900,000 in restitution. As a result of BIC's subsequent denial of his photo identification application, that individual has been barred from working in the new Fulton Fish Market. And last Tuesday, the Commission denied the registration renewal application of Stepmar Contracting Corp. based on the failure of the applicant to inform the Commission that its principal associated with a high-ranking member of the Gambino crime family. The company's principal also refused to testify under oath during BIC's investigation of the application. These cases are a sample of the broad range of corruption issues that BIC regularly addresses. We have numerous ongoing investigations and will continue to work to remove corrupt elements from both the trade waste industry and the public wholesale markets. Collecting and transporting trade waste, particularly in New York City, is a dangerous and strenuous job. 
The collection trucks are huge and must share the road with many other motor vehicles and cyclists and pedestrians. This administration has made safety in the industry and on the city's streets a priority. Historically, BIC's jurisdiction over safety was limited. That changed on November 20th, 2019, after the council passed and when Mayor de Blasio signed Local Law 198, expanding BIC's jurisdiction to include traffic safety in the trade waste industry. It specifically enables BIC to deny a license or registration for safety issues that rise to a level that warrants denial. We are a small agency with a big mission, and that mission continues to grow. Together with commercial waste zones, the safety legislation will help improve safety in the trade waste industry. Since Mayor de Blasio appointed me as commissioner last April, BIC has greatly increased its enforcement activity with an eye toward improving both safety and overall compliance with BIC's rules and regulations. We have increased our focus on unlicensed and unregistered haulers operating without BIC approval. As shown in our PMMR statistics in the first four months of fiscal year 2020, we issued 41 violations for unlicensed or unregistered activity versus 20 in the same period of fiscal year 2019. Additionally, BIC has continued our partnership with the NYPD's Transportation Division, conducting regular joint truck enforcement operations with them. BIC also now has a strong partnership with the NYPD's Collision Investigation Squad, which investigates all fatal traffic collisions in the city. When one of those collisions involves a trade waste truck, BIC's investigators go to the scene so that BIC has full information regarding the company and driver involved and can stay informed about the criminal investigation. And last month, two BIC investigators joined members of the NYPD for a two-week traffic crash investigation course given by Northwestern University's Center for Public Safety. One of BIC's most intense focuses this past year has been on ensuring compliance with Local Law 145 of 2013, the Trade Waste Vehicle Emissions Law. This law requires that all heavy-duty trade waste vehicles be equipped with an engine certified to the 2007 EPA standard or later, or utilize specific retrofit technology. The law's mandate went into effect on January 1st, 2020, and covers more than 5,100 trucks as of today. Leading up to the effective date of the law in 2019, we spent a great deal of time and effort reaching out to the industry to ensure BIC's licensees and registrants were educated about the law and knew how to comply with it. In December 2019 alone, we spoke to nearly 300 companies about the law. With our outreach came increased compliance. In December 2019, companies turned in more than 300 BIC-issued license plates for non-compliant trucks, thus making those trucks ineligible to legally haul trade waste in New York City. In January 2020, companies turned in plates for more than 400 additional non-compliant trucks. In early February, we began issuing summonses against companies with non-compliant trucks. To date, we have issued 100 such summonses. Each comes with a $10,000 fine per truck, and the companies are given 60 days to correct the issue per the law. If they correct it, the summons is withdrawn. Our sister agency, the Department of Environmental Protection, has been a valuable partner in the effort to inspect retrofitted trucks to ensure that they comply with the law. The PMMR is a measure of BIC's achievements, efforts, and goals in carrying out our law enforcement and regulatory duties. BIC fulfills its mandate through rigorous background investigations, criminal administrative investigations, and the development and enforcement of our regulations. With respect to administrative violations, BIC issued significantly more violations to BIC licensed and registered trade waste companies over the first four months of this fiscal year compared to the same period last fiscal year. This increase is primarily due to trade waste companies failing to comply with commission rules, such as providing BIC with a complete and accurate customer register and reporting collisions. For the city's public wholesale markets, the number of violations issued in the first four months of this fiscal year remained consistent with the same period a year ago. Although improving our efficiency in the application process is important, BIC must maintain its high standard of background review and investigation for all of our applicants. As a regulatory and law enforcement agency, we must be thorough. Our investigations are dynamic and can become quite complex. This past year has been particularly challenging to our efficiency for a number of reasons, one of which is that BIC's headcount fluctuated greatly. 
At one point, due to a high rate of employee turnover, BICS headcount was down approximately 20%. Yet with a strong focus on replenishing our ranks, we are now nearly at our maximum fill of 91. Perhaps more importantly, the past year was extremely busy for BIC in virtually every department. BIC personnel spent large amounts of time working on high priority initiatives and other projects which pulled resources from application review. Those initiatives and projects included preparing for enforcement of and implementing the mandate of Local Law 145, responding to inquiries from the City Council's Oversight and Investigations Committee, working to provide comments on and implement numerous bills directly affecting BIC, preparing to register unions in the trade waste industry, working with the Department of Sanitation on the Commercial Waste Zones Program and numerous confidential long-term investigations. As a result, the number of pending trade waste applications increased from 564 in the first four months of fiscal year 2019 to 597 in the same period of fiscal year 2020. And market applications increased from 36 in the first four months of fiscal year 2019 to 93 in the same period of fiscal year 2020. The average time to approve a trade waste renewal application increased by 58%, and the average age of a pending wholesale public market application increased by 32%. Despite these challenges, because we prioritize reviewing new trade waste applications as opposed to renewals, the average time to approve a new trade waste hauling application saw a modest increase from 126 days in the first four months of fiscal year 2019 to 158 days during the same period of fiscal year 2020. This is important because new applicants cannot operate unless their applications are, are approved, whereas companies submitting renewal applications can continue to operate while their applications are under review. This year, we will strive to improve those efficiency numbers. This summarizes our recent work. BIC is looking forward to the challenges in the year ahead, including continue to, continuing to improve safety in the trade waste industry and ensuring compliance with the vehicle emissions law. We now would be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> I don't have many questions, but I do want to get right into Local Law 145, which is one of my greatest concerns. Uh, to put in context, this uh, law was put together in 2013, uh, was asking for trucks to be compliant with 2007 EPA standards, right? So six-year-old standards and that it would not be implemented until 2020, January 2020. Uh, so we're arguably giving folks seven years, well, we give them seven years to get into compliance, and that the compliance they had to get into was what I consider an outdated um, uh, standard set forth by the EPA in 2007, which have changed since then. If we want to talk about climate change and we want to talk about um, real crises and how we react to it, um, this is the bare minimum that we must do. Your agency took it upon itself to not enforce the law uh, from, ja uh, from its implementation day of January 1st, 2020 until February. I want to know what, what um, if any, uh, excuse uh, BIC can have to not wanting to enforce from January to February. I also want to note that if they are in violation, there is a 60-day cure period put into the law that allows for these uh, trucks to be put into compliance 60 days after they receive their violation, which would mean that they can be compliant on March 1st as of January 1st should you give them a, a fine or a violation. So considering all these safe gaps and all, these, all this white glove and a handling of with white gloves of these industry, why add another month of, of, uh, of seeking for them to get to compliance, given everything we've done so far to make this as easy as possible. Um, to be honest, laughably easily impossible, uh, e easy to, to accomplish. So first, and thank you for your question, let me say that we recognize the importance of Local Law 145, and particularly the way in, in which it positively affects the lives of those in underserved and overburdened communities. And as you said, the effective date of this law's mandate comes at a particularly important time for our environment. So um, enforcement of this law has, is complicated, has been complicated. Leading up to January 1st, we did, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, a lot of outreach to uh, the Carters to make sure that they understood 
uh, how to comply, and to find out what their, what their plans were. And as we went through December, we started receiving you know, plates from non-compliant trucks, taking those trucks off the road. We received uh, over 300 plates from those trucks in December, and that continued in January, where we received over 400 uh, plates from trucks, effectively retiring them from service in the trade waste industry. Uh, <clears throat> we also are working with the Department of Environmental Protection to get retrofits inspected to make sure that we had good records when we went out to go inspect those trucks to make sure that we were not misusing our resources and we were effectively using our resources to target the non-compliant trucks. So that's what we did in January. In the very beginning of February, we went out and instead of going around the streets looking for non-compliant trucks, we went directly to the yards of the companies and targeted those so that we could get if possible, all of their trucks at one time in one place, and we could inspect them all at one time. And now, one month later, we've got 100, and I actually think today we issued another one, 101 uh, perhaps summonses against these companies, each of which has a $10,000 uh, penalty if they do not correct within 60 days. They, some of them have been correcting already, uh, and so we're looking forward to continuing to enforce this. We will be continuing to go out. Um, even So we have a list of the companies with the non-compliant trucks. We're about two-thirds of the companies uh, that have any non-compliant trucks have only one non-compliant truck. So we're going down the list. I think the most right now that have not been hit with a summons uh, is three or four possibly five, but I don't think so. I think we've hit them. So, uh, and we are gonna continue to go down the line. And even after we go through all of those companies, we are also gonna be continuing to check to make sure that retrofits that have been done are effective. And you know, we're not engine experts at BIC, but um, we've been working closely with DEP to uh, make sure that retrofits get inspected. We're gonna continue that. And to the extent that we, if we find that a company uh, should be compliant based on the year of their truck or based on the fact that they've gotten a retrofit and they are not compliant, that they will get another summons or worse, depending on the nature of uh, their noncompliance. So do you, do you not feel that the seven years prior to this legislation actually being implemented was enough time for your agency to prepare um, to to uh, look at these trucks that are supposed to be retrofitted, um, or uh, this this time for these um, these companies to to become compliant. So as of right now, you're saying that they're out of the list of non-compliance. About one third is yet to be reviewed. So there are companies right now that could be using these trucks that are non-compliant. Well, no. So I, well, so is it is it a resource issue? I guess is the question that I want to ask you. Oh, so I mean, so we we make the most of what we have, and um, we have 10 investigators. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, and to give you some compliance statistics, um, better compliance statistics, so our, um, the way that we measure compliance is through our vehicle uh, portal, which we've been building uh, the data in the vehicle portal for the last three years. Um, and we use that, we ask a number of questions about the truck, so that we can figure out whether that truck is compliant. And if it's been, if it's too old and needs a retrofit, that's when DEP is inspecting it. <clears throat> uh, and we also use that vehicle portal to target enforcement of local law 145. Um, based on our data, more than 5,100 trucks are covered by local law 145. And of those in scope trucks, 91.8% of them are compliant as of today. Uh, and that's approximately 4,700 trucks. 7.2% of the trucks are not compliant, which is approximately 370 trucks. Um, of course, we're going to continue to go out inspecting, as I said, uh, and we will continue working our way down the list to try to, uh, take, as, to take them off the road. But, uh, you know, so we have been, you know, our inspectors have been going out regularly and um, targeting the yards of the company so that we can get those trucks 
together. And Commissioner, I just want to, I guess, do you understand my frustration as to the fact that a law for 2007 EPA standards, which at this point would not even be considered a, uh, uh, a significant uh, improvement or a significant, uh, I guess, um, environmentally friendly EPA standards anymore. EPA has actually modified, I think, the standards twice since 2007. And that we passed this law in 2013. So we already gave them a relief by saying the trucks can be six years older than when this law was passed. But then after that, say, you know what, we're gonna give you seven more years to try to figure this out. We're gonna give you seven more years. So, uh, and then after those seven years, we still have 300 trucks on the road right now, as we speak, that are not compliant. And I hear the progress that you're making, but you're not in the business of progress. You're in the business of enforcement, right? That, that you're not a service, uh, a service agency that is here to educate folks on exactly what they should be doing. W that should have been done seven years prior to this being moving forward. And it, and it so, was, and so, and we had, I mean, we certainly- I just think that they're not the gonna time. take us seriously if we go about passing legislation that's not gonna be enforced by the enforcement agency like that, that is responsible for we it. We are absolutely 100% enforcing it. And, and that's No, there's where 300 trucks that have not been, hasn't, have not, that are on the road now that are not compliant. That is your fault. Well, that that's- They're still there. So I, I do understand your frustration 100%, but, uh, um, you know, so we, as I said in my testimony, we have a lot of different responsibilities. And when it comes to enforcement, I mean, we are, we are making sure that we are hitting all of our different enforcement responsibilities. Our uh, environmental justice issues are now ver are very important to BIC and they have become part of BIC's mission. BIC's mission also includes anti-corruption uh, right. and now also safety. And so our 10 investigators are going out, we're out there day and night, almost every day, um, we have teams out and we're looking for, okay. we're enforcing local law 145, we're looking for commingling, we're looking for safety issues, and we're also uh, looking to make sure that organized crime is not creeping back into the industry and other forms of corruption. So we have a large mission and I completely hear what you're saying and we are working very hard to get those other trucks off the road. So, and, and I just wanna, my frustration comes from this, this timeline, right? If I pass a law today uh, and it gets signed today but it doesn't go into effect in a month, I understand that we would have to have a conversation about the rollout and so forth. It might even give us some opportunity here to, to have a waiver period or a grievance period. Uh, but this is seven years. And that's my frustration, is the amount of time that we've given for this to come into compliance and that we're still not there and the standards themselves are not significant. I just wish you would have started on January 1st and I'm upset that that didn't happen. Moving you. forward, should we have legislation that is passed that gets, gives you a seven year grace period to figure out, I would suggest that maybe we don't wait, give them another month um, unnecessarily to, to fall into compliance and we start taking care of our planet and we start addressing climate change. So that was my frustration. I just wanted to make sure you heard it um, because it, it's, it, I just didn't understand and I still don't understand why that one month grace period had to exist. Um, so the commercial waste zone implementation, uh, do, do you foresee needing additional staff to support full implementation of the commercial waste zone or do you feel that the staff you currently have can help you achieve so that? We, we are going to be heavily involved in commercial waste zones and we are already in conversations with OMB about our staffing needs specifically with respect to commercial waste zones. So um, we're, we're going to continue that conversation. We have a very good relationship with OMB and we will be continuing uh, those conversations. And just being able to give us a breakdown of where and what you might need to do that would be important as well. Okay, and uh, right this moment I, I can't do that, but um, I'm, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, talk to you more about it. Yeah, we have the, the Commission of Sanitation Department said that we are like 18 months away from like anything that's more con that's concrete. So we have time, but um, when we do have a staff lines that exactly what they are, so we can uh, know how to advocate to make sure that you're fully staffed. Um, uh, so Bix primary function is go after organized crime. Um, and I wanted to ask to date, uh, FY20 to date, how many violations were issued to offenders? Um, so I wanted like the, the primary function. Um, I, I heard a couple. I heard one, uh, one more recent one here related to a million dollar 
uh, that was one, stealing by an employee. One uh, of the that was one of our denials. But as far as violations, uh, yeah. that administrative violations, um, fiscal year 2020 to date, we've issued 702 violations, which is significantly more than we did a year ago. Since I became commissioner, we've increased enforcement significantly. Uh, and so to give you in fiscal year to date 2019, up until the date of our testimony last year uh, was 437 and uh, we've now issued 702 this year. And that's because uh, we've seen more problems and we've uh, had our, we've sort of um, altered the way that we're using our investigators in that we are scheduling things very specifically, trying to make sure that we're hitting all the different things that we're doing. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the things that we have been seeing is, uh, at least that we've been catching, is an increase in unlicensed and unregistered activity, which I see as being particularly problematic because they have not been vetted by BIC. And um, we've, we're going to continue uh, on that path because uh, we, we've now, I think, found a way to where, where we're finding them regularly and um, we need to continue to issue those violations. Thank you for that. I have a, one more question, but I want to allow for Councilmember Margaret Chain to, to ask some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner. My question is that um, in your testimony, you're talking about coordination with other agencies like DEP. So for example, I know like in my district, for example, there's a lot of construction going on and a lot of renovation, new construction, and we see a lot of these uh, waste, um, you know, truck that collect the waste, and some of them, they um, demolish it right on the street. So is, it, is this under ju uh, the jurisdiction of bid? to inspect them to see if they are doing the correct way uh, in terms of you know, the workers wearing protective uh, gears and also protecting pedestrians who are walking by. Um, they're, you know, they have the water down or whatever. Is that under BIT's uh, jurisdiction? So the actual demolition is not under BIC's jurisdiction. We deal with the actual hauling of it. So once they, they put it in the truck and then, so frequently construction companies will get a BIC registration so that they can cart away the debris that they generate. But we're not directly involved in the regulation such as the personal protective equipment for the workers who are doing the demolition and the watering it down. When you talk about safety for the pedestrians, um, whether or not that's, what, now that uh, Local Law 198 is law, um, we have much more uh, responsibility in terms of safety. It's mostly traffic safety, but um, incidentally, we have seen uh, times when carting companies are not uh, functioning safely and um, by the sidewalks, and we have taken action to uh, try to fix that and you talk about interagency uh, collaboration and it's been I think quite successful. There was, there's one uh, that I can think of in Brooklyn where uh, regularly there was a truck that was parked on the sidewalk and it was obstructing pedestrians, there were strollers going by uh, and one of the big problems was that the street was narrow uh, and if they didn't park on the sidewalk no cars were able to get by but on the other side of the street, there, was, uh, there were cars parked. And by working with uh, the NYPD, we were able to change the signage there. And now the truck is able to park in the street, and it's much safer for everybody. So in that way, we keep our eyes out for safety issues. But when it comes to the actual demolition of a, a building, for example, we're not directly uh, involved in that regulation. So even though like they're, they are gonna be hauling away the, the garbage, what they're doing is before they take it away, they crush it there, right. right, on the street. So if it's not your jurisdiction, then whose jurisdiction is that? Well, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'd be very interest, interested to learn more about it because if it isn't, I will help find who it is. And so if we could contact you about, these, about the specific um, spots, we'd like to take a look. 
Yeah, because like if constituent asks us, right, they file a complaint and we ask them, you know, to call 311, my curiosity is that they call 311, where does that, you know, get route to? Because it's happening quite often because we have so much constructions and renovations going on. Well, so this is, I mean, this sounds like a great time for us to collaborate with perhaps uh, Department of Buildings or another agency, but I'd, I'd like to find out more. Um, if it'd be okay, I'll have somebody from uh, my agency contact your office and try and find out the specifics so we can go take a look. That, I, I welcome that, and I, I was thinking that it should be Department of Buildings because they have to get permits, and if there's some coordination between Department of Building and, and, and your agency, then maybe we can really try to improve some of the condition that's happening. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, my last question is I'm very interested in BIC's investigation related to traffic collisions. I think the city does a, a terrible job um, at investigating traffic collisions in the city of New York. A lot of uh, the time, because of car culture, um, the cyclists or pedestrians um, or the car, the, the driver of the vehicle is at no fault. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with just the process by which how the investigations happen. Um, I would love to have an opportunity to meet with you so you can let me know how, how this works and how you contribute um, to better understand because I would hope to get um, what I consider more justice to pedestrians and cyclists in our street um, that don't seem to, to, to have that because uh, the collisions department in the NYPD tends to just write off these things as accidents. Mm -hmm. um, and I have huge issues with that. Um, so we'd love to have a conversation with you. But go Abs ahead. Absolutely. Um, and absolutely. Just so that um, to just briefly answer, though, you know, it is the NYPD that does the criminal investigation. And the reason why we're going to the scene is because we look for other things. And it's important for us to know what happened so that when now, especially now that um, Local Law 198 is in effect, when we're when a company comes up for review, um, we are looking at their safety record and it, we need to know what they've been involved in. And one of the ways to do that is to get a first-hand look by going to the scene. Right, and that, that's I think a part of it as well. Um, if we're still giving out licenses to a very dangerous company, um, that's problematic to me. And given 198 and the new authorities that you have, I hope that is something you take seriously uh, because uh, we're very concerned about the, the high rate. Um, when you look at the Department of Sanitation's numbers compared to the private sanitation industry when it comes to um, reckless driving, there's a huge disparity there. And I just want to make sure that um, we could address that. Not only, you know, what, what I think happens usually is only the driver um, uh, gets charged or gets uh, the punishment and the repercussions uh, is these uh, the owners who I think put onerous uh, uh, responsibility on their drivers to do things um, and they end up cutting corners and they get all the heat and the owners don't so I want to make sure that we talk to see how how you feel that we can address that issue it's a, it's complicated and but one of the things that I can tell you and I'm so I'm happy to talk to you more in depth about it, but one of the things I can tell you is that where the driver is arrested um, for whatever it is we track that case because when if that driver is convicted of a crime uh, that then also does go back to the, under our authority, the owner is also responsible for the actions of the driver. And so we will then go back and issue an administrative violation against the company for failure to abide by the law. So that's one of the things that we do. That's good to know. So again, I wanna thank you for your time and for your effort. Um, I, do, I do have a, this head count. I, the 10 investigators, I try to count it up, but I only counted 37 when you talked about the breakdown of your staff? Oh, it was, I was just giving you, um, I wasn't telling you every person that was in okay. the agency, but I'm happy to go through that if you wanted me to. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, but so we have, right now we have 85. Mm -hmm. um, we had one uh, person leave, I think, last week. But we also have two people who are approved by OMB and one other person awaiting approval. So shortly, hopefully, we'll have 88, and we're actively searching for three more people, an attorney, a background investigator, and a computer programmer, which would take us to our full headcount. So that, that's good to know, because my, my issue is with the 10 investigators that you have, it seems like you do a lot, and I don't know if they're overburdened at this point, at this moment, and I would rather you be fully staffed there so that we can catch up 
on my local law 145 issue and make sure that everyone everyone's held accountable we are currently filled with with our lines with investigators we are constant we're regularly uh, meeting and discussing at, with OMB about our needs uh, and but you're right that we do do a lot and we are working very hard thank you thank you so much commissioner for your thank time you. here I appreciate you coming by and your staff as well thank you thank you uh, we're now going to start the public uh, portion of the of the day it's our two com two committees we have uh pierre simmons melissa yashan um or justin wood uh and stefanos uh to please come come forward and if you haven't submitted uh your information please do so uh to the sergeant at arms standing here uh if you want to testify Thank you. Okay, Melissa, we'll start with you. How are you feeling, Council down. Member? I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling better today than I did Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, making it work. Good. Thank you for asking. Uh, of go course. ahead, Melissa. Um, good afternoon, my name is Melissa Yashan, not Justin Wood, and I work in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. As our city continues to face the dual crises of climate change and social inequality, it is critical that we adequately fund programs to ensure that our city diverts waste from landfills and that we realize the central goals of the city's solid waste management plan to move waste processing away from the truck-intensive private transfer stations clustered in low-income communities and communities of color. We strongly support DSNY's organic waste recycling program, which diverts food waste from landfills. But as DSNY's own waste characterization studies reveal, most of our organic waste is still going to landfill. Organic matter decomposing in landfills is a major source of methane emissions, and recycling this material via composting or controlled anaerobic digestion processes is essential to reducing our city's greenhouse gas emissions and also has the potential to assist our city in moving towards more local renewable energy generation. We understand that DSNY faces significant efficiency and cost-related challenges with the current voluntary curbside organics program, which have led to a troubling pause in the program's expansion. It is clear that without adequate funding to expand the voluntary curbside pickup citywide and begin to phase in mandatory organics recycling, we will never take the important strides forward in reducing our carbon footprint while moving closer to zero waste. We strongly urge the city to shift to phased in mandatory curbside organics collection program, which has proven effective in boosting waste diversion in other major cities. This would necessitate new and stronger outreach, particularly in areas of the city where the voluntary program was never rolled out. The council must fund a citywide mandatory organics program at $42 million, which figure includes adequate funding for outreach and education in communities who have not yet received brown bins over the past several years. We further believe that the department can find additional creative solutions that would increase the efficiency of the residential organics program during this mandatory phase-in, while tackling the even larger problem of commercial organic waste. The commercial waste stream is estimated to be about equal to the residential one, about 3 million tons of putrescible trade waste per year, and about 1 million tons of this huge stream are organic material. Troublingly, private transfer stations reports filed with the DEC show that very little of this material is diverted to compost or digestion facilities. We believe DSNY could substantially increase small business participation in organics recycling and improve efficiency of existing compost routes by offering an affordable brown bin organic service to small businesses in communities where DSNY already operates residential organic service. Such a program would allow workers to fill existing organics trucks, allow small business owners to divert far more of their waste from landfills, and boost business participation in a meaningful recycling program in advance of the new commercial waste zone system. While reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a priority of the city as a whole, reducing landfill-bound waste will be even more beneficial in communities where truck-intensive waste transfer stations are clustered. Importantly, the city's 2005 2006 Solid Waste Management Plan called for DSNY to begin utilizing marine transfer stations for commercial waste by 2010 to further reduce the amount of waste and trucks going to these private transfer stations. It is now a decade later and we still haven't begun to use the four state-of-the-art city-owned facilities to help make the commercial waste system 
more efficient and reduce pollution. As you know, the commercial waste zone system implemented this year will greatly reduce the number of miles traveled by commercial waste trucks on their collection routes, as haulers will be awarded specific zones rather than traversing the city to find customers. Giving these haulers access to publicly owned MTSs will allow them to operate even more efficiently and would reduce the number of diesel collection trucks and long haul export trucks operating in environmental justice communities. I can go on if you'd like me to, or I can just conclude now. There's two more paragraphs, three? Okay. Having access to efficiently located marine and rail-based facilities is also advantageous for local private haulers in bidding on waste zones. You don't, need to, you don't need to read so fast. Don't worry about it. Michelle. Okay. No, no. Including smaller companies that do not own their own transfer stations. Any private hauler collecting commercial waste in Midtown Manhattan, for example, would benefit by being able to tip waste at the East 91st Street MTS, which would eliminate several miles of driving and the bridge crossings currently required to get to private transfer stations in the outer boroughs. It is a no-brainer, and yet, in order to fully utilize these facilities with incredible potential, the council must allocate funding for them to run longer hours, and in particular, those hours during which commercial haulers tend to dump the waste they collect overnight. By adding a third overnight shift to currently underutilized marine transfer stations, DSNY would also be creating additional high quality green jobs in safe facilities. We therefore urge the mayor's office and city council to ensure that there is ample funding in this year's budget to begin operating the MTSs at full capacity and begin accepting commercial waste during an overnight shift. We know that Commissioner Garcia and DSNY share our desire to make strides in the push to zero waste and a reduced carbon footprint, and we hope that the Council will take seriously the need to fund these important initiatives at DSNY in order to make these important policy proposals our path forward as a city. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> okay, I'd like to start. Uh, my name is Pierre Simmons. I'm a canner and I sit on the board as Vice President as sure we can. I'd like to start this out by first bringing to mind, and this involves everybody in this room, we're facing a plastic pollution crisis with nine million tons of plastic worldwide entering the ocean each year. The state bottle bill is effective in preventing plastic containers from being littered and entering water bodies. And this information comes from Judith Inc. But in less than two years, four redemption centers in our area have been closed. We collect millions and millions of plastic bottles and cans that without the canners would stay exactly where they are, put, polluting our streets and oceans. Two weeks ago, Sure We Can received a notice that will be that we will be evicted from our location on April 30th if we cannot come up with $3 million the owner asked for, the lot. For the last 10 years, Sure We Can has been at 219 McKibben Street in Brooklyn. We have adopted many services, including storage bins for canners, a community teaching program, and a compost program, and upcycling project for plastic film, single-use bags. We also run environmental education programs with local schools, universities, and other partners, and forge alliances with the Canner community and organizations in the, er in the area to further reach out and service the, the traditionally undercounted immigrants, low-income people, elderly, homeless, etc. We do not have anywhere else to go. There are no affordable or appropriate sites. We would need a nearby location as our members work on foot and are mainly elderly or disabled. Eviction from our site means abandoning these who society has left behind and even forgotten. Judith Inc. in her letter to the New York Times editor wrote, when, when I worked, a, when I worked a, to pass New York's bottle bill in 1982, I made the point that children would pick up empty beverages, containers, or supplement to supplement their allowances. Little did I know that the growing problem of income equality 
will result in thousands of people relying on nickel deposits as a source of income. It will benefit everybody to up, update the 1982 law by increasing the nickel deposit to a dime and by adding non-carbonated beverages, beverage containers such as iced teas, wine, and liquor. The Department of Sanitation is, supposed, is opposed because it does not want to lose money from recyclables by its curbside recycling program, she says. The city can rem remedy this by supporting redemption centers and helping to establish new ones. The redemption center should be required to send material to recycling companies that the city has contracts with. The canning community is self-motivated, inspired, and hardworking, and needs the help of the city to continue to reduce pollution and making a living. The New York's bottle bill has succeeded in preventing tons of recycling material from going to landfills and polluting our streets and oceans. The Redeemers provide a public service need and need the support of the city and the Department of Sanitation to continue. We can continue pollution together. We can, we can fight pollution together with your support. Thank you. I'd also like to add this. Contrary to what you might have heard earlier in terms of sanitation, getting, doing more recycle, I'd like to say this. I am a canner. I'm the expert. I'm the one who goes into those bags. People, Councilmember Reynoso, are not recycling. More recycle ends up in garbage bags. That is where the bulk of recycling is. Recycle in one particular neighborhood is only once a week. Once a week. But you have canners who make $100, $200 a day. They can't get that from recycle. It's impossible. It is impossible. I don't make my money off of recycle. I mean, once in a while, I'll pick some up if it's there. But there's so much inequality in terms of money for people. They fight over those recycle bags. It doesn't make any sense for me to go into them. I go where the money is, in the garbage bags, and occasionally there's a, there's a, not necessarily on the sidewalk, but a can, a recycling can I might go into. But I don't make my money off of recycle. But I am here to tell you that there are more cans in the garbage bags, in subway stations. Sanitation can never get it. They never can get it. I lived in New York City before there was ever any of this bottle bill. And I'm telling you, when you got up on Saturday morning 50, 55 years ago, the streets were covered, covered with bottles. If, if you had the amount of recyclables on the streets now that you had then, oh man, you, you'd be able to pay your rent for two, three years. <laughs> it's just not happening. The, the canners are the ones who are bringing in the bulk of the recycle. And we seem to be pushed out of the picture. Four recycling uh, redemption centers have been closed in our community. And this has put a strain on us. Now, we're doing things that no other uh, uh, recycling places ever did. We feed the poor. We give clothes to the poor. We want to start a um, social services program. But we also provide a place where those who want to be independent can work and come and bring in. You have immigrants who are not on welfare. They don't get SSI. But they're able to work together in husband and wife teams. You have the Chinese. You have the Mexicans. These people are geniuses. They make the money, man, that I wish I could make. I definitely wouldn't make it on a, on a minimum wage job. I wouldn't, but they can. And they take that money and they invest it in their families and their children because they don't have a career here. They're just coming here. And these people pay taxes. 
It's got to be a way that the sanitation, the sanitation department and Canada's can work together. We're thinking about using Sure We Can as a, as a waste drop-off point for sanitation. But uh, the recycling in those blue bags don't represent 10% of what's out there. And Canada's are out there seven days a week Early in the morning, three, four o'clock in the morning, you have women in their 80s and 90s, and it breaks my heart to see that, but that's what it is. They're going out there. They're the ones that's bringing in all these tremendous loads on these shopping carts. These are not all homeless people. These are immigrants who are laying the foundation for the next generation, because they can't spend all that money. I mean, they could, but I don't think that's what they're doing. So we're so just so we we are by the way having conversations with this uh, with DSNY. We want to have a meeting between DSNY and the Canning community to really figure out a way that they could be collaborating and work, and that they could work together so that redemption centers and just a, a better conversation about what's happening with recyclables can happen. Um, we're trying to do that very quickly because you. You know, April is uh, a ways is not a ways away. It's right around the corner, and if that redemption sensor sure we can't shuts down, it's going to be a big problem. Mm. So we're trying to do that as quickly as possible. And um, it seems like we have a huge issue with enforcement or the lack thereof by DSNY that allows for the general refuse to have more recyclables than the recycling um, bags. Uh, so um, I appreciate your testimony, and we are hearing it. Um, we're trying to do something. I don't know if the meeting is this week. We're trying to have something done as soon as possible so we can meet with sure we can specifically about their facility. And we, we are on the same page related to um, recycling or waste centers, um, which are conversations we've had um, in the past. And we're, we're very interested in them. And we're, we're starting that in a more meaningful way through legislation and policy. So I really appreciate your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to keep building. But uh, the timeline is really tight right now when it comes to it's the sure we can stuff. And we are paying attention to that. Okay. We're, we're aware, I guess, and I'm actually very concerned. Um, but we like, know we, you, you've, you've been involved with this. I know, but we, we, we're, I'm very concerned because I don't know if there's an easy solution to this, um, and I'm worried about what you know, not finding a solution means. So yes. we're, we're working on it, though, and we're, it's a top priority in the work that we're doing in our local office. So, again, thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis? Councilmember Reynoso, Councilmember Chin. Uh, my name is Stefanos Koulias. I represent the Coalition for Progress Progressive Waste Management Reform. Last month at a Brooklyn Swab event, Councilmember Reynoso said justice should not have a price tag on it. The Coalition for Progressive Waste Management Reform, a coalition of members of the three swabs, academics, and community and nonprofit organizations, formed that evening based on that statement. We are now here to make the case for significant realignment of resources, financial and otherwise, to further environmental justice, advance progressive waste management reform, and pursue true waste equity beyond the measures called for in the Waste Equity Bill and commercial waste zoning. In its most complete expression, waste equity would be an application of the principles of the public trust doctrine applied to sanitation and solid waste. The coalition recognizes the Council's commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, advancing the Climate Mobilization Act, and as a response to mass protests less than a year ago, declaring a climate emergency. We also recognize Councilmember Rivera's and Constantinidis' efforts on a resolution calling on Congress to pass and the President to sign the Green New Deal into law. But this coalition believes that the longer we wait on the federal government, the less time we have to achieve zero by 30, as outlined in 1NYC. Meanwhile, the recycling rate hovers at around 17%. I don't know what Commissioner Garcia was telling you, but the numbers, her numbers right here are not 20%. They're still like 17%, which is about half the national estimated average. While their curbside organics recover, uh, the curbside organics program, which has, has a coverage of less than 10% of New York City's population, and a participation rate of 10% for that coverage area has been stalled indefinitely. It's not working. 
Meanwhile, community-scale composting, which places both the built and the social infrastructure within communities to promulgate organics recycling, has been defunded or entirely unfunded. The largest community composting site in the U.S. to run entirely on renewables is right here in New York City. And yet its founder, David Buckle, is no longer with us, large, in large part due to death by a thousand cuts and a thousand slights. Meanwhile, informal waste management sector workers often are undocumented and most destitute operate in a gray area. At best, they receive no official recognition for their dual value that they add to society writ large by one, extracting redeemables from a commingled waste system, waste stream And second, the potential of real-time outreach and education that they represent to the people in their community, the people that they live with. At worst, they are, they are outright persecuted. What kind of a vision of social justice is that? Meanwhile, waste inequity is perpetuated by a lack of investment in NYCHA housing, a veritable city within a city investment to provide training and empower tenants associations to enter into revenue sharing partnerships with the city tied to recycling performance. What is it that's preventing us from scaling the worker owned models that Green City Force and Inner City Green Team have implemented? What prevents us from applying those same revenue sharing partnerships, tying them to recycling performance with community boards across the city offering bonuses or multipliers for participatory budgeting. Meanwhile, DSNY, for everything it's doing right, claims to employ a one-size-fits-all model so as to provide uniform service, while at the same time bemoaning challenges presented by the variability of housing stock, which makes a one-size-fits-all model approach inadequate. And does DSNY offer uniform service across the city? NYCHA residents might beg to differ and have, in fact, gone to court over the issue. Expecting a one-size-fits-all approach to work for everyone in the world's most diverse city seems like a case of cognitive dissonance at best. Meanwhile, our waste management remains less democratic than ever. The city, citing the exigency of externalizing waste, enters into contracts with corporations that contain language to the exclusion of ad hoc and community-based organizations, organizations that would otherwise be playing a meaningful role in waste management. These contracts instead favor corporations that are subject to highly volatile commodity markets, or entire countries like China simply refusing to accept our so-called recyclables any longer. These corporations cannot, by design, operate with environmental justice as their ultimate priority, as environmental justice is not as salient to those corporations as it is to the frontline communities. It was less than 10 years ago when then Mayor Michael Bloomberg reinstated the curbside recycling program after having canceled it for two years. While there has been a recent surge in recycling infrastructure investment in the U.S. to sort and refine commingled recycling, time will tell whether these facilities ultimately succeed. Most importantly, however, is the question of what role the city can play in the global circular economy and how the city's residents can not only participate but benefit. Meanwhile, the commercial sector, from Amazon to Whole Foods to your neighborhood dry cleaners and wine store, they've realized that using a truck to get around is nowhere near as efficient as a cargo bike, and that a hub and spoke system rather than a centralized model of distribution makes a lot more sense. At the same time, Teamsters Local 831 balks at efficiency measures, such as GPS for route optimization while collection workers have little time or opportunity to engage with the public on their routes. That stated, this coalition recognizes and appreciates the value and necessity of collective bargaining rights for the working class, 
but not at the expense not at the expense of digging our own graves with union labor. We will actively oppose and argue vehemently against attempts that lead to the uberfication of trash. A gig economy approach that we view as a race to the bottom, further divorcing New Yorkers from their relationships to their discards. I'm almost done, Your Honor. One more paragraph, please. We recognize, however, that there are untapped technologies such as blockchain-based carbon credit exchanges tied to recycling performance that could improve the resource recovery landscape. A blockchain-based carbon credit exchange tied to recycling performance where the onus of participation is shifted from individual decision to community benefits such as civic waste centers, civic resource centers. The city in turn would realize greater carbon reduction and thus harm reduction and be better equipped to meet its carbon reduction commitments and zero waste goals. Meanwhile, communities in upstate New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Ohio, and so on are sick and tired of our garbage, both figuratively speaking and quite literally. Do we want to invest in a future economy based on exporting, landfilling, incineration, and the exploitation economy, or invest in local health, local jobs, local justice, and the solidarity economy? Guys, I'm about to cut you off, um, but thank you for, for your testimony to, to thank you, you all. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Right. Um, I'm, I'm hearing you all. Uh, the commercial waste stuff coming into um, our facilities that we've built out makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it's an intention and a goal that the city of New York might have. I'm having conversations with DSNY now, but we're not there yet. The organic stuff absolutely is low-hanging fruit that we should be handling this year. I would say that um, with the money. The money will come. If we legislate it, the money will be there. So I feel comfortable that organic recycling is something we will do before the end of this year. Um, again, we're working with... Uh, DSNY to try to figure something out with the short-term goal of sure we can, um, while also having a more uh, comprehensive conversation about how we're going to handle trash in the future or long-term here in the city. And, you know, we've been handling trash the same way since the 1970s, um, even later than that, and we might have to start being innovative about how we do that. The thing is that sanitation is one of the slowest moving or the, the tankers that are the hardest to turn around, so it's going to be a, pro a pr progress or slow progress in the work that we're doing here um, in the city of New York, but it is something that we're looking into as well. So I want to thank this uh, panel for speaking, um, and I'm going to call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next panel is um, Dr. Tuk Oyowole, Dr. Tuk, uh, <laughs> Chio Valerio Gonzalez, Debbie Lee Cohen, Bridget Vicente, and John Orcutt. You could all come up at the same time, please. Um, sure. We don't have a hard stop. I want to give people enough time. Um, just be very mindful of the time. I don't want to, I'm not even going to put the clock. I just want you to like respect the time. I don't want to have to cut you off. Um, so please. Uh, are there four seats up there? There's a fourth one there. You're good. Um, we need one more. Okay, or. He got, he got you. He got you. Well, they got her a seat because it's going to be here. John, I'm going to start with you and move down this way, okay? All right, thank you. I don't think you're, I don't think you're mic'd up. Take the... Thanks, Chairman Reynoso, for raising the issue of how our, the size of our street sweepers is actually driving street design in New York, specifically bike lanes that are so wide that you can drive a semi-truck into them. Um, we won't spend a lot of time with a prepared statement, but um, we'll say that one of the things that was really striking when we looked at this issue in other cities was how different departments work together from the get-go to align street design and vehicle procurement. Um, so like a city like Denver said, well, if we're going to have protected bike lanes, we need street uh, snow plows that are going to be able to fit in there. Um, and they bought those the same time that they started the program. We've been installing protected bike lanes in New York since 2007. 
we're 12 or 13 years into the program, and we still don't have the sanitation department on board. So we're really um, you know, excited and eager to work with you to, re to resolve this. Clearly, it's going to take a lot of outside pressure to make our different gigantic agencies work together um, to get our streets into a safe place. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to have a conversation. So we're talking about starting in bids or in certain areas and pilot them, whatever we can do to, to start addressing the issue of uh, not allowing vehicles to move into the bike lanes. Um, Grand Street in my district is a, a primary example of how we shouldn't design bike lanes where vehicles have no problem moving through them. And actually, have a, they have a protected lane in, in my district if you go through the bike lane and you're a vehicle. I mean, um, we fought to get hard, stronger barriers on that lane. Yeah. And it's just, it's just providing even more protection for the trucks that are driving up there. Um, you know, one of the things we, um, we think we could do, you could have a pretty wide bike lane in New York if you had the skinny street sweepers because you could actually cap it with a bollard or something. And the street sweeper could still get in there, but the, but the other trucks couldn't, and we would have room for all kinds of bike traffic. So it, it would open up a world of design possibilities if we can get this. And DOT has been laboring under this problem for years. Yeah, we'll, we'll have those discussions more intently moving forward for sure. Okay, um, appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. John. I appreciate it. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Dr. Tok Oyewole, and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. For decades, NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities. The impacts of the solid waste system are greatest in a few low income and communities of color where truck dependent transfer stations are clustered, causing higher proportions of health consequences such as asthma, heart disease, COPD, and various cancers. We are here today to advocate for adjustments in city budget allocations for the upcoming fiscal years that we think would dramatically improve equity for environmental justice and frontline communities and ensure the city's commitment to its stated goals. Investing in staff for overnight MTS shifts. Commercial refuse is collected at night and primarily dumped in private transfer stations in a handful of neighborhoods. The city's marine transfer stations are more equitably distributed throughout the city, including some in Manhattan, and are not yet at capacity in accepting waste. Staffing the marine transfer stations at night would help to reduce burdens in the handful of communities overburdened by both truck traffic and private transfer stations, which are not currently adhering to city zoning laws, for example, in Southeast Queens. This would reduce the impacts of odors, leachate, dust, truck idling, and air pollution, and facilities that are not all fully enclosed. This would also allow more carters to use the MTSs under the upcoming change to a commercial waste zone system. Extending hours and staffing at MTSs can also help private carters to route trash away from private facilities that are currently enabled to evade city zoning codes by failing to meet stricter laws for facilities near residences. Opening Gansport Marine Transfer Station. In New York City's 2006 Solid Waste Management Plan, the city committed to allocating $25 million to open the Gansport Marine Transfer Station, handling metals, glass, and plastics. This is supposed to be matched in kind by the state government through the signing of an MOU. It is 14 years later, and the Marine Transfer Station is still not open, which means that recyclables are still routed in large quantities to transfer facilities in overburdened neighborhoods. Implementing Commercial Waste Zones Law, Trucks and Transfer Stations. The carters selected under the Commercial Waste Zones Law will be required to follow strict standards. We want to ensure that those who bid and receive contracts based on robust submissions properly adhere to the laws. This includes ending commingling of garbage and recycling, installation of elect electric vehicles, ensuring use of MTSs, investment in facilities improvements, and charging stations to motivate transitions to electric vehicles, among other things. Regarding the carting contracts with private transfer stations, we want to ensure that inspectors check and suspend work at transfer stations that do not have enclosed buildings and do not meet high performance standards as required by law, and do not award these bad actors extended decade-long contracts under the commercial waste zone system. Mandating residential organics collection in the proposed fiscal year 2020 and 2021 budgets, funding for waste prevention, reuse, and recycling is reduced compared to previous years, despite our need to meet robust zero waste targets by 2030. 
Among many needed initiatives, the city should make the necessary investments to mandate residential organics as promised years ago, as opposed to voluntary programs in a few privileged neighborhoods. There is a robust program of residents voluntarily bringing their waste to compost drop-off locations, showing that a mandatory program would be utilized and would make our city's waste management more on par with cities like Seattle and countries like Germany. Enabling microhauler organics processing at DSNY-funded facilities while opening more organics processing facilities. Funding should be allocated within the budget to make investments that would enable zero and low emissions microhaulers to access DSNY-funded organics processing facilities, such as Big Reuse, Earth Matter, and Red Hook Composting Facility, as they have repeatedly requested. They have been enabled to scale up their organics collection under the forthcoming commercial waste zone system, but within the same law, they were disabled from tipping at privately run transfer stations. This begs the question, how are micro haulers going to be able to scale up their diversion of waste from landfills, and what measures is the city taking to support this goal? There is no more time to waste. We need organics processing capacity within the city. Additionally, the city should reconsider DSNY's put-or-pay contracts that incentivize dumping higher rates of waste in incinerators or landfills and put this money instead into well-run organics processing facilities. Thank you for the opportunity to raise these concerns. We encourage the city to invest in the development of long-term waste reduction and waste equity plans to reduce burdens unjustly faced by a handful of communities and to preserve our planet's limited resources. Thank you, Dr. Tso. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chio Valerio Gonzalez, and I am the campaign director at Align. Um, and along with Align and a handful of coalition members, uh, we advocated for the commercial waste uh, system. And under the leadership of um, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, we were able to pass it. So, you know, thank you for that. I'm here just to echo uh, what my colleagues from Nija and Nilpi have been saying. Um, you know, we want to advocate for the opening of municipal marine transfer stations to receive commercial waste. Um, the, there will be a significant reduction in VMTs, especially in EJ communities that have bared the brunt of the commercial waste dumping for years. Um, so, opening uh, the Opening the waste transfer stations at 91st Street and Gansford would significantly reduce the pollution that these communities are facing already. Um, but I want to talk specifically about what it could mean for workers in these transfer stations. Um, recently, I was able to have a meeting with a couple of workers uh, that worked at a Bronx transfer station um, where they described uh, wage theft, um, rampant wage theft for undocumented workers. And even for those that were documented, um, they had absolutely no security in their job. They were fired ad hoc. Um, some of them uh, testified saying that they were forced to handle medical waste without having any actual training in it. Um, and so there wasn't any, uh, at these private transfer stations, oftentimes they're just told, hey, just dump it where it's supposed to go instead of, you know, if you get a rat bag, it's supposed to go elsewhere. Um, they said that they handled a lot of this uh, waste without any proper uh, protective equipment. Um, additionally, they also talked about uh, the order and the enclosement of these transfer stations um, and some of the injury levels that they had encountered were extremely high. So opening up the transportation, the municipal transportation can actually mean good green jobs for the communities that are needed the most. We need an expansion of green uh, good jobs. Um, and given the state of our climate crisis and the fact that you know the president's uh, environmental priorities are really just tragic, um, we really need New York City to step up um, and make sure that we have a planet that our kids can live in and a clean New York for all of us. Thank you. Hi, hello, Council Member uh, Reynoso and Council Member Chin. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for all that you have done to um, uh, promote the plastic bans and support the plastic bans. I'm Debbie Lee Cohen. I'm the executive director and founder of Cafeteria Culture. We were founded as, styro as styrofoam out of schools in 2009, and we catalyzed the elimination of styrofoam trays from all New York City schools and the nine other large urban school districts. 
We're actually working now to get rid of the rest of the single-use plastics in, in school cafeterias. On May 15th, we have a plastic-free lunch day that we're partnering with uh, Department of Ed, School Food, now OFNS, um, to um, citywide, and maybe the city council would like to join us and show support for all of our 1.1 million students who will have that opportunity to take a climate action on May 15th. I'll send you some information about that. Um, so we ask ourselves as a cafeteria culture team all the time, how do we get to zero waste? I wake up every morning asking that question. I'm a parent, an educator, and a stage four cancer patient just coming off my 40th chemo treatment. I don't always say this, but I decided today to say it because I feel an incredible urgency that I feel relates to what my students feel and many youth that we just don't have time to waste. That's actually how we were able to convince the directors of school food to let's get on with the plastic free lunch day. We can't wait five years, like it has to happen now. So we're, as we move forward, um, I thank you for what you've done in the past to eliminate a single-use plastic citywide, and I ask for your total support to continue with the straw bill. Let's help get that to the floor, and the other single-use spans as well as the reusable bills. How can we bring those forward? Our youth want to help, and we're eager. Um, about expanding organics, it is time. Uh, we had a meeting with the mayor's office and Rebecca, uh, the men my mentee, who's 17 on Monday, about the unfairness of half of the schools having organics collection and the other half not. So I'm here also to urge you to make that a priority. Of course, I care about residential as well, but schools, like, we are missing a gigantic opportunity. You know, every year that goes by, I'm like heartbroken because I can see what happens when kids have it. Rebecca's one of those kids. She, she started in fifth grade, she's now in 11th grade, she's in a school that doesn't do any recycling in the cafeteria, and she's shocked by it. So I know, like, if we can do this now, we can start, it's like building equity, you know, in our students, in our youth. Um, NYCHA, many of our students live in NYCHA housing and you know the difference of being in a school where you're told to work towards zero waste and recycle and then you go home and there's no infrastructure or there's not even a trash can, there's the loner recycling bins with no trash can and the recycling bins are full of trash. It's, it's an unjust situation that our city actually has to focus on in order to achieve our zero waste goals. But the meat of what I want to say today, and here's the real gut of it, is that I'm here to ask for your support this year to work towards zero waste climate literacy from peak pre-K up through 12th grade in all of our schools. It is time for us to triple our investment in environmental education. I just feel like we are teaching, we not, when I say we, not cafeteria culture, a lot of the money from Department of Sanitation that's going towards education in our DOE schools is going towards the same kind of uh, narrative that we've been teaching for 30 years. My daughter told me about an organization that came into her classroom in high school, and I said, oh my gosh, that sounds like what they taught me in the 1970s. I thought, how can we still be getting away with that and wasting our tax dollars on that? So I'm urging you to actually provide for our 1.1 million students hands-on interdisciplinary curriculum that teaches the why with the how. We're not going to get anywhere if we don't teach the why. We need to change overall our narrative for all education about waste, making it appealing because we connect it to the climate crisis. We connect it to environmental justice. I've, t I've taught lessons at least in thousands of classrooms at this point for the last 10 years doing exactly that. I know where the aha moments are, and those are the aha moments for kids from age from pre-K, even pre-K, up through all of our teachers. You know when they look up and they say, oh, gosh, I didn't know that. So we need to provide students not just with good, solid, science-based climate crisis education, but community leadership roles and the opportunities to design the solutions, not just to be taught the solutions, that, that they take, they take on the responsibility to design the solutions. And giving them the opportunity to take climate action right in their school cafeterias on a daily basis. That's why we're doing the Plastic Free Lunch Day. That's how we pitched it to school food directors. And I actually believe that's why they bought it. They felt like, okay, Rebecca told me, you know what? I can't afford to take every Friday off to strike. I've got to get a full scholarship to college. Her parents are, you know, pushing her every day. So 
What is so part of this is with our youth, we thought, well, how do we come up with climate action that can happen right in schools? And that's, the cafeteria is an excellent place to start, but that's reframing the narrative. So if you're not sure, like, what this kind of education can look like, we took care of that for you. <laughs> we spent years, three years, dedicating our lives and our shoestring budget to making this documentary, Microplastic Madness. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso, for your participation in that. I would love for you to see it. Maybe we could host a screening here with council members. It shows what a two-year in-depth quality environmental education that's interdisciplinary, that includes civics, community outreach, um, collecting I mean, data. Debbie, have you talked to DSN? Have you sat with DSNY and the Department of Education? I know you've met with the Department of Education, but I mean, like, to seriously consider this curriculum? So um, we, we meet regularly with Meredith, McDerm Meredith McDermott, uh, the head of sustainability. We have not yet met with people working on curriculum and those offices at DOE, but we need to. And if you would like to help me, your office could help make an introduction, and I can ask Meredith for that, I too. Think, that would be great. Yeah. The timing's right. I think right. you're, yeah, because while DSNY and the work that we do is more like meat and potatoes about making sure that these schools do this work, right. um, it isn't about educating or any curriculum-based uh, work necessarily, right? So um, we we could put the, the trash out. We could put the different trash bags, different trash bins. We could tell people to use recyclable, um, biodegradable work um, right. stuff and separating. But the work of like, educating and doing all that falls into the school. And if you have to build something, it would have to be done probably through the Department of Education. So I, I think I we would have to talk to um, whoever the chair of the Department of Education is, like uh, Daddy, not Daddy. Uh, Traeger, is it now? Traeger, Mark and, Traeger about it. But, but I do that. actually see this as an inter, is an intercommittee issue. Absol because, absolutely. Because the messaging that's in schools that we're paying for through the DSNY budget, they're the same old signs that go in our basements. We've made other signs, and we can see the difference. You just put up an exciting sign that's colorful, that's bright, that's, you know, what a difference it makes. And how you tell the story of it. So we'll, so let's do that. In the stuff okay, that we can do, control, great. right, the stuff in the Department of Sanitation related to the outreach that's happening in these schools, you believe that cafeteria culture could, like, take on that role in assisting in the development of, like, this educational material. Material. Great. So I want to. I want to. Let's try that Perfect. as like an achievable goal that we can put together. I'll talk to the Department of Sanitation, their media and their outreach or whatever, the marketing team, whatever they're doing in schools. I want them to see if they can meet with you and maybe use you as like a consultant, free of charge for now. Right. Uh, but consult. We've been working for ten years this. almost, free yeah, of charge exactly. for New York City. We're dedicated. Consult this to do it the right way. So let, let's work on that. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Debbie, you. Thank you. I think that's a good so way much. to start. I'm going to try to do this introduction and hope that we can make it happen, okay? Fantastic. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. And we love cafeteria culture. We love you guys. And stay Thank tuned. So we got a lot of good stuff coming in the council. We soon. can't wait. Thank you so okay. much for all Thank that you. you do. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Hello, council members. Thanks Hello. How are you? Hi. Is, your, is it on? Is it on? Hello. There you go. This is a little background. My name is Bridget Vicente, and I'm a lifelong NYCHA resident. I thought I was recycling by bringing my recyclables down and putting them in the bins outside my building for many years until 2006. That is when I discovered my recyclables were being thrown away with the garbage. I felt disappointed and disparaged to learn there was virtually no working recycling program in NYCHA. With these feelings of frustration, I visualized a solution for a convenient way for my fellow NYCHA residents and me to recycle. To address this, I founded the Inner City Green Team and developed the Door-to-Door -door Recycling Collection Initiative. ICGT's mission is to protect the environment and help transform the lives of residents living in NYCHA developments through education, job training, and paid work that can lead to a lifetime of employment and civic engagement. Bridget, Ms. Vicente, can I ask you, I yes. think everyone here knows what you do and who you are. I hope they do, at least we do. Okay. But I wanna ask, you heard the testimony of the, the commissioner. I, and <laughs> and she, was very, she was very dismissive of what she considered low outcomes. So I wanted to uh, get, you know, like spend time in your testimony okay. um, to, to speak to contradicting that if you think you can. Okay. Um, but, uh, what they, they see the value almost exclusively on outcomes. So we need to talk about that because I want to be able to make a case to her that you did do that. I didn't have the information on me as she was relaying that, so I couldn't fight back or I couldn't 
go right. back and forth for her. So I want you to educate me on how you might disagree with her assessment of the work that you were doing um, in NYCHA. Well, first off, let me say I completely and utterly disagree. Um, I happened to just walk in when we when you said the word Brownsville and she went on to to say um, that our job, what we were doing out there is, is minimal at best, which is completely false. Um, as far as I know, throughout all of NYCHA, we are doing the best recycling um, in the city. We average uh, 500 uh, pounds a week and um, that has totaled to uh, over 18 tons since we've been out there. Uh, since uh, June, July, since July uh, 2018. When you got the contract originally, were there goals set that you needed to achieve? Um, they wanted the, um, the recycling rate to be increased to at least uh, 20 percent, if I'm 20 percent, and um, we were out there for four months, and we increased. It was the number was two percent, and we increased it to almost eight percent, seven point nine percent, and we were only out there for four months with a, a very small budget and just. Um, yeah, we we have a two billion dollar budget, and we don't do 20 percent. I just want to put it in perspective. Yeah. Um, I want to have a conversation. I think what is going to end up happening is the city council is going to figure out a way to take care of you. Um, we're, we're still going to talk to DSNY and hope that they can partner with us so we can reintegrate this program back into um, Brownsville. If we can't, I'm going to try to figure out a way in the council that we could f do this work. And we need to set goals, which we will do, which I think you're more than happy to try to accomplish or achieve. I want to make sure you have the resources. Um, the city, NYCHA recycles at 0% right now, right? And they want you to go from 0 to 2 to 20% to in four months. It's completely unreasonable. These folks want to go to zero waste by 2030, and they're still at 18%. So, the, like, the standards that they're giving you and setting you for is, is that they completely are a wash of it, and they have no accountability or responsibility for it. And for them to say that your program was inefficient or it didn't result in the outcomes that they wanted, um, anything is better than 0%, which is what's happening right now. And it's building culture. And they, you're saying that they only gave you four months to do this work. So I want to I wanna have another conversation with you. I want to, if, if I can't be there, you'll meet with my staff. But I just want the contents of the work that you did mm -hmm. so to, to make sure that I can make the argument to DSNY. And okay. worst case, that we figure out a way, hopefully, in the city council to be able to make you whole. But I wanted you to hear what the Department of Sanitation was saying, because that's what they would tell me behind closed doors. And I just want to make sure that you, you see what we're fighting against is a, an administration or at least an agency that doesn't believe in the work that you do. Um, so uh, we're going to get to brass tacks here. We're going to meet with you. And before the budget is over, we'll have an answer as to how we're going to be able to do this work. Because I believe in you, and I think that you're doing great work. Thank and, you. And we want to... We want to allow for you to be a model that we could have everywhere else. If everywhere in the city was doing 8% in NYCHA, we would be doing an amazing <laughs> amount of work. That is something that I can't believe that they would say is not enough. Yeah, um, so um, they're going to have to give me different answers moving forward, but I want to get the content of the work that you did so I can use it in my arguments against them moving forward. I have images for every collection since we started. All right. So... Uh, and trust me, the amount of money they gave you is probably chump change. Don't say how much it is, but I'm telling you, 8% for whatever you're doing is probably the most efficient way they're spending their money in the entire, in the entire budget. So thank you. So I just didn't want you to go through okay, your testimony yeah. because uh -huh. I know who you are. I, I like the work you do. I just wanted to know if you heard what she said so that we could be prepared. I heard, par I heard, okay. I heard Parsha. I heard you grilling her. Tried. And tried. Um, yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's total false. Totally false. I know. It's discouraging. I, don't, I, I just, I'd rather her have said it in a different way because if somebody else wants to do this work, we want to encourage it. We want to empower people. And that was a very disempowering message from her. Or it came out very wrong. So I want to follow up with her and see if we get to a better place with this okay. and then get back to you. 
Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And then you were the Mariano Rivera of the night, so you shut down the, the meeting. You're the last one. <laughs> so I just want to thank everybody for being here. I'm sorry if it went over. I want to thank Councilmember Margaret Chin for staying here the entire time. Um, and as of now, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear it all.